Hey guys, Justin with Deep Dive Stocks here, and today we're going to be looking, we're going to be watching the live chat that we had earlier in the week on GME. The video is a pretty long, but that's only because we talked about some pretty fascinating things, both from a Deep Dive Stocks perspective and some valuable insight that was provided by the participants of the live chat. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and start the video. But if you are interested, every Sunday we have a live chat. I look forward to seeing you. I think you should come and it's pretty fun. So, all right, let's get started. Welcome everyone. We'll go, um, go ahead and get started. All right, I can't multitask by the way. So today we're gonna be looking at GME and I, when I was kind of trying to brainstorm today's chat, I was trying to figure out where I wanted to go with it. What did I, what angle did I want to take? And I settled on the idea of, I wanted to present GME through the lens of some of the data that is available to the deep dive community. And I wanted to kind of focus on pre-squeeze. So the idea was I was always interested in GME before the initial run-up. And I think a lot of, because a lot of theories that I am aware of rested on kind of how people were positioned before 2021, and then kind of the consequences of what happened after the run-up or, you know, what were the coping mechanisms? What were the strategies that kind of popped up to save some financial institutions? So I wanted to do some digging before the squeeze. And then I wanted to really only use kind of the surface level data to demonstrate both how we can search through that data and how that data can be pretty impactful. You know, I think there's kind of this preconceived notion that the, um, that some of the analysis and some of the, uh, yeah, analytics that are done on these derivatives and these stocks are kind of outside the realm of like a normal, what a normal retail trader could do. But I'm kind of here today to show that that's not really true. You just kind of got to keep asking questions and going on threads until something pops up. The And then finally, we're going to end it with how, oops, how GME is doing today, right? So what are the, how are the conditions before the squeeze, and then we're gonna look at a little bit of after the squeeze, but really we wanna focus on towards the end of the discussion, what is happening on GME today? Do we see any patterns that we could see before re-emerging and so on and so forth? If throughout the discussion, this is definitely gonna be a discussion based um, talk. So again, don't hesitate to pop a question into the chat or pop up in voice. Uh, the more that I found with these live chats, the more we all just kind of interact with each other, the more we take away from it as a whole. So without further ado, if anyone, if anyone has any questions, if not, pop a one in the chat for me and we'll go ahead and get started. Start digging in. I just need one, 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 one in the chat. Thank you, Harvey. I'm assuming everyone agrees with Harvey. Thank you, Bart. All right. So. One of the things that I do when I'm looking at a stock, and can everyone see the, are the graphics big enough? I assume, I think it's like to whatever size you said the page, so maybe the, so maybe that's not a concern. But what, one of the things that I do whenever I'm investigating a stock or a, a period of time on a stock is I simply look at Vorex. Uh, for those of us who aren't too familiar with Vorex, we don't have to go into it, but the idea is that you want Vorex to be within these two horizontal lines. That's when a, when a Vorex is inside those two horizontal lines, the stock is considered stable. So clear, so the idea is that whenever Vorex moves outside of these horizontal lines, uh, a stock is considered unstable. So the initial 30 second glance at Vorex for GME, and this is from 2021, January, 2021 to 2019, uh, what's the 10th month, September, October, October, 2019, this immediately, pointed out to me. So Vorex does some very strange, has some very strange behavior in the, in December of 2019, and then in January of 2020. And what was curious about this was this time frame uh, was always kind of curious to me because of those like 
I always had the lingering question of those $1 puts that popped up on GME. And I vaguely remember that something was associated in this 2019, 2020 range with those puts. So I kept that in the back of my mind. But we see that something on the Vox alone is telling us that something interesting happened here. And then obviously things really started getting interesting here. The, but there was a little bit of a more subtle finding maybe for those of us in the chat that are familiar with GME, uh, but well, just off the, off the cuff, why is this portion of Vorex interesting? Anyone, Conway or anyone wanna? Maybe, maybe not. Um, well, interesting how, because uh, we see that it's consistently spiking um, into the inhibition zone and like the initial spikes, would suggest bullish behavior. The kind okay. of interesting thing about it is that it's so persistently high above the, um, you know, that that top line of, of the middle zone. Right, and Harvey said, he's not really sure, um, because it is it is kind of in the channel, but this is, so this is called the inhibition line. And this isn't really gonna be what the talk is about, but one of the, like the future investigations, when one of the things about Vorex is the classical behavior for when Vorex goes, from in the propagation zone into the inhibition zone is that the price is appreciating too quickly. The market is unprepared for that level of price appreciation. The large institutions aren't positioned to handle it. And so we see Vorex spiking into the inhibition zone and aptly called the inhibition zone because now we'll, we'll start to see the introduction of forces to move the price back down. But in this case, GME really didn't experience any price movement yet Vorex ran into the inhibition zone. Just a curious finding. And again, today's talk is really just, um, I kind of want to add to the discussion for the people who are very familiar with GME. Price is below the channel, Vox is above, kind of King Boo. So with the Vox graphs, the position of the, like relative to the two horizontal lines uh, only has to do with Vox. So really the price is kind of just there for us to reference. Um, but it, the price doesn't really have an association with the two horizontal lines, just the Vorex. So, but again, just curious, because again, I don't know does if anyone who is familiar with GME, did anything interesting happen in when this transversed? So like February of 2020 to March of 2020, right? And that would be what it would be. And that's what Vorex is telling us is that something happened here that pushed the, the foundation the stability of the stock out into the, or up into the inhibition zone. But nonetheless, I was really interested in these bad boys, bad boys right here. And so I started doing some digging. And the first thing I did, one of the, Vox is plugged into a few things, but one of the things that is kind of easiest to just look at is if we look at the behavior of the options um, on a stock. So what this is, is a, standardized oops, daily percent change. Okay. So what we did was from 2019 to 2021. And also note, you'll, we'll note that this time frame is consistent on all the graphs for easy comparability. But what I did was every day, I directionalized all the options and then looked at the daily percent change then standardized those daily percent changes so that they can be compared with one another. And we see what's cool is when you standardize in this way, these little signal spikes start to pop up. And these spikes represent when the percent change of a, Barry got out, I'm not sure. Uh, again, I don't know much about GME, so I don't really know who Barry is. I know of Barry, but I don't know what his association with GME is. Um, but these spikes are show us when the behavior, when the daily change of a particular type of option was like significantly different from the uh, normal, right? So we see that, for instance, when those these random spikes were occurring, oops, going in 2012 to two or February of 2020, we also now have an associated behavior of massive options spiking. And again, I want to emphasize that these spikes are significant. So this is because this is standardized, 
these numbers represent the probability of a sense or like how outlierish these points or these changes in the options are. So for instance, a 2.5 is about a two sigma is 68, which is about a 70% of the extreme values. So 70% of all options movements are less than 2.5 standard in value. And we get peaks up to 10, which is like 0.0001%, right? Like 10 sigma, that's kind of what the physicists go for. I think they go for five maybe. So we see that the take home message here is that we can already see just by looking at the daily percent change in the types of options. So we have, and again, by types of options, not again, I always, that's my catchphrase, but I want to emphasize that these are directionalized options, right? So the out of the money long calls. So, and from the dealer's perspective, out of the money long puts, out of the money short calls, out of the money short puts. So for instance, here we see a lot of out of the money dealer long calls. Let's zoom in a little bit. Right. Uh, and these big spikes are out of the money dealer short calls. So when they're out of the money dealer short, that means that retail came in and purchased someone in the retail, and that could be large institution, hedge fund, came in and purchased from a counterparty, from a quote unquote authorized market maker or options dealer, uh, a significant number of these options. And one of the things that we're going to look at later, what caught my eye also, is that these significant changes in options are very timely, right? Like, so the, this light blue is, for instance, this spike right here is an out of the money. I think it was a dealer long, right? I have the memory of a new, yeah. Dealer long put, which means someone came in and sold a significant number of puts and when do puts that you sell appreciate in value when the price of the asset goes up someone here this dark blue is a dealer short put. when do dealer short puts gain value and it's when the asset falls which is exactly what happened and so what i noticed was that a lot of activity on gme was put oriented there was and there was very opportune put purchasing and selling on because again we can see in these spikes that the massive like one day change in options are just very uh, kind of conveniently placed here's another spike of dealer short puts and gme fell for the next like three months and what's curious too a second finding that today that we might I didn't get to dig into it this time, but well, actually I'll pose it to you guys. Besides the spikes, is there any other interesting findings on this graph? What other interesting, because I, I can think of two. So Barry, Barry first reduced, Conway said, Barry first reduced his position according to September 30th, 2020, 13F deadline. He would have reduced his position sometime between June 30th and September 30th. Um, yeah, sorry. I was just responding to the question in the chat above when- No, that's um, perfect. Let's, so that's June, what's June, the sixth month? Yep. I, I've got a timeline in front of me. There's a member of the community that created a website called gmetimeline.com and it, is fairly up to date, but it has a long record of all of the events that have happened or many of the important events that have happened with uh, GME. So we see when- Perfect, do you mind popping that link in the sure. chat? I think it'd be great, yeah. yeah. And this is beautiful. This is like, cause I don't, I'm not aware of these things. So the first one is the June 30th to September 30th, which would have been here. Doo -doo -doo. So somewhere in there, very reduced his position. Grim Tao said a, the quarterly cycle, which I think does surface here a little bit. And then when was iPhone 11 Pro Max? When did Cohen's initial purchase occur? 
but he just bought shares, right? But we could see if some did someone position advantageously for his initial purchase. Maybe, maybe. So what I found, because I didn't know any of that stuff, the I thought it was odd that what's different about like these periods? No. I guess 2020. What's August, January? Eight. So Cohen purchased here. I'm not the only one who's going mad about the little mermaid. Yeah, but Harvey, that's so. I was also sorry. I was thinking, I was distracted. I was trying to figure out if anyone may have. Uh, knew yeah. about Cohen's buy-in, which would I assume would populate in options. If someone knew that he was going to make a big purchase, you go ahead and uh, purchase some calls. And, but yeah, I didn't, but I didn't see anything with that. But I, uh, or Harvey, I agree. There's not much activity here. And that's curious to me because why do these essentially break the pattern? I'm always curious in things that break the patterns. Another thing that there's also, there's one more about this, these data. Otto Leavitt. I'm sorry, what was that? I Otto Leavitt. It sounds like he's talking to a dog or something. Maybe we should just mute and move on. Who's talking to a dog? I, I can't tell. Somebody. Yeah, because it doesn't show me as having is anyone. Sorry, guys. All right. Uh, do do do. Jimmy bottomed out first week of April, July twenty twenty. Bottomed out before the squeeze. Yeah, good. But so the other notice I found was we have these huge spikes up, right? We have these huge positions being opened. Why are there no huge spikes down? Why are there no significantly large closures? Right? There's only ever significantly large openings, and they do seem to be pretty well timed. So that was the first thing that kind of piqued my interest. Because the idea is that if I open up a large position, say I open up a whole, I sell a whole bunch of puts here just like that spike did, someone in the market did. My intent is for either volatility to go down or for, oh wait, it did the price to go up. Uh, there were instances where that didn't happen. I'll see, it. we'll see it in the puts maybe. But the idea being that we can see these clusters of activity and then these clusters of inactivity. And we already start to see that these significant openings of positions are pretty well-timed. Here's another dealer long put right here. And then the price appreciates for the next month. Someone made a, a healthy penny. Yeah, diamond hands, or as we're kind of gonna hint at later, because again, I'm not necessarily a, yeah, but iPhone 11, exactly, they drizzle out. Because if we look at the average uh, movement or the where like the non-spiky behavior occurs, we see it's below zero which means that on the vast majority in this time frame, every day, a, like, it's like a small bleeding of options are, are going out. Nothing gets closed dramatically. Things only get opened dramatically. So I guess that would be the third interesting finding is the net average movement or the daily, the overall behavior you would say on GME before the run-up is that every day options were just kind of bleeding out. And then it seems like they were reopened in force in a sense so then again i was always curious in the puts and it looked like the puts were um, a main force in gme so i went ahead and just i re removed the calls calls are pretty boring and looked at the puts and now we can really see how opportunistic these puts really were right so the especially starting here 
someone starts to become very good at timing the market. And we can see even here, here's like a spike of dealer short puts. And as GME depreciates from that point on, we see little activity in the puts. They just slowly bleed out. Flip the IV with snap, with snap. Yeah, so it's interesting that you mention IV because uh, we're gonna, there's something weird that happens with IV later on. No time for retail institutions to buy at decent prices. I, yeah, I don't, I think they were closed, Bart, um, but they, because the, av or like, I'll just use the word average, but because this line barring the spikes is below zero, and here's your zero, that means that the daily movement for these options was kind of just a, a slow bleed. Like they were just casually closed. They were only opened with force. And again, we can see that they were opened, uh, except for this spike, right? This spike did not time it well. So if anyone knows anything that happened from 2020 June to July, because GME fell in price, but someone sold a whole bunch of puts, that probably wasn't good for them. But even then we don't see significant closures of those options. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So we're gonna keep that in mind. So the idea is that we, I always was interested in like those $1 puts, but in just looking at GME before the run-up, we see that some strange stuff or very opportune stuff starts to pop up when we have this directionalized view of these puts. I mean, someone, I mean, this alone right here, like could have made someone a millionaire. Like look at how well timed. So the dealer short puts, here, so they want the price to go down, price plummets. Here, they want the price to go down, price plummets. Here, but in here, a little bit. This, I guess, is the only position that got lost. And then if we flip the coin, when we, if we look at the dealer long puts, so the puts where that they will profit the most when the asset rises, right? Someone made out like a king here. Someone definitely did not make out like a king here. Oops. But we also don't know what IV was doing. Someone made out like a king here. Someone made out like a king here. Someone made out like a king here. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Out of six, they got four. That's not too shabby. So um, a couple of things. Uh, is it that someone timed the puts extremely well? Or is it? The, the tail sort of wagging the dog where you buy so many puts that you force the dealer into hedging by selling and then you therefore cause the price to go down and therefore you cause yourself to, to make money by just yeah, buying I mean, so many puts. So the idea is, so if you, if we give the dealer, yeah, so if the dealer goes, has long put, then what is their delta? If it's dealer long puts, then they have positive delta. What, what delta does a dealer have if they are long a put? Short delta, right? Oh, short delta. It's because they own a put. They purchased a put from you. So yeah, so you're, you are correct in a sense that that short delta would be hedged from purchasing shares. And that is an interesting idea. I would just argue that this is so like if we took if we looked at the first in this kind of this chunk of sequence does that explain all of this movement would be like my question rolling positions over time that uh, rolling positions uh very well could be absolutely and then grim tau grim toe how do expirations look when plotted in this manner if an option goes to expiry we're gonna see we're going to see this from a different vantage point, but it will include expiry. The second thing I wanted to chime in, I mean, again, there's, a, there's just a lot of stuff that we could compare to the timeline, um, but specifically- No, please do, yeah. You asked about uh, June to July. June um, to July, yeah. Uh, let's see, June to July. What did we, what did we want from June to July? July, well, I, July. Uh, this, this, uh, again, there's a lot, but at the, um, let's see, 
Dr. Burry voted at the beginning of July, GameStop announced senior notes exchange offer, converting all outstanding $414.6 million of 6.75% senior notes due 2021 into 10% senior secured notes due 2023. Um, they reported earnings. Moody's places GameStop's ratings under review. Credit Suisse lowers their price target to $3.50. Um, we also have some Bloomberg. When did that shots. happen? What date was that? Uh, June 9th, 2020, the Credit Suisse lowering the price target. Hmm. Um, so Moody's, someone, you mean yeah. like the day someone bought a whole bunch of puts? Right, yeah. And mm-hmm. we, we also have um, a Bloomberg terminal screenshot of GameStop. And, and under it, it says Credit Suisse with the same person, I, I believe, Seth Sigmund entering, um, or what's it called? It, it just tells their, their, their position. This was a, a while ago when GameStop was pre-split $220 a share. Um, So what is that? That's uh, $45 today. Right. Um, And at that point, Credit Suisse apparently was underwater by 5,663% on that GameStop position. Ah, so (laughs) very advantageous for them to be like, actually, this stock is worth nothing. (laughs) Right, yeah. (laughs) Very, uh, it's always fun when you get to set the beat to the drum, right? Um, so that's curious, right? And, but this is why I love this data. And again, I kind of wanted to, I didn't want to come in here with like the fancy Dan, like, I didn't want to like guns a blazon present this data. Like this is data, like Conway, you have this data, right? Like, you. so I kind of just wanted to demonstrate how I process this data so that maybe it, it, uh, gives you some ideas. Like now we know, like, look at how much we pulled out from one graph like all these activities that we can explicitly associate with signals in these directionalized puts. And that opens up a whole area of investigations that we can go dive into. And also just to, is it, is the tail wagging the dog kind of moment, going back to what you said, I, coincidences occur, I do not trust them. That is my personal philosophy. And when I see large spikes of options that benefit when a stock appreciates in value, and then immediately the stock starts appreciating in value, and I see that multiple times, this is no longer a coincidence. And so yeah. that's kind of where I'm at. <laughs> Somebody always knows something. Someone does. And you just have to figure out, because they're going to, they're going, going to broadcast that they know it, right? You don't know this type of information and not make money off of it. And to not right. to make money off of it, you have to participate in the market and everything in the market is connected so we can find it. All right. So this kind of reinforced the idea that I, because again, I was always just interested in these one dollar puts. It seems so odd to me. And so, and then now that we looked at the options activity, saw that there were some, definitely saw there was options or there was odd put behavior. It seemed like a natural transition to look at the $1 and 50 cent puts that I was super interested in. And so this is what we do here. And we see that quite an odd introduction of puts. And this is a little foreshadowing, right? But these $1 puts, I have it here. Someone probably knows off the top of their head, I'm sure, but... These puts opened up on, the majority of them opened up on 2019, 11.20. And they had an expiry of 2020, 0.1.17. And this is a date that we're gonna just chuck away in the back of our heads for later. But what's curious about these puts from this graph? I mean, I think there's a lot of curious stuff about these puts, but. Uh, does Simplex Citadel on the market maker side? Yeah, I'm a, so again, I'm not a ten, I'm I really want to exaggerate or like not exaggerate, but nail home. I don't typically wear a tinfoil hat. Like you have to convince me that certain things are occurring, but this data convinces me that certain things are occurring. So you put a little context uh, into that 2019 date. Um, let's see. At around that time, not exactly on the 20th, but on the, what is this? Right around November 14th, I think. 
Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Michael Burry filed a 13F revealing that his GameStop position increased to 3 million shares. And shortly after that, Melvin Capital also filed, or maybe that's the same day, filed their 13F revealing 40,000 GameStop put contracts. Mm. Oh, I know. So I saw that. But, and then we're going to get to that. <laughs> the, that's so cool. That, I love having you guys here that know this stuff about Jamie. Because again, like I was looking at this data and I don't really know all this stuff. And it's just really interesting to see it all line up. The, what I found was interesting though about this These values, so this is do, 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 about 30. This is, do, 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 do. we'll say, what, 60. So this gives us a max of about 90. This is about 120. This is about 120. Why do these puts show up? in pretty similar amounts and they show up dramatically literally in the course of a day so this jumped from 20 000, so 100,000 some puts right and even when it, when you look at the 0 0.5 and the $1 puts and i bet we if we looked at me say the $2.5 puts we would be able to fill this gap and it's not just that the amounts are the same, the total open interest amounts, it's that their opening behavior and their closing behavior are very similar. I always thought that was curious. So then the next step, so now that I'm honing in, this is kind of my thought process, I'm honing in. Yeah, I think that, somebody has a question. Oh, what's they're, going on? They're really quiet. Yeah, hey, it's James. Um, I was just wondering if you saw uh, that picture I posted under your tweet about GME. Um, so we look, I think we looked like into these, um, put contracts like a long time ago, like almost a year ago. And just a simple charting notice that 35 calendar days after every expiration, when a bunch of these deep out the money puts expired worthless, Jimmy had some sort of run. So mm -hmm. I, I put the picture under your, um, under one of the tweets you sent out recently. Can I paste that here? Can you share, can you share images? Do, 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 do. Or if you're in the Discord, maybe drop it in Discord. Oh yeah, I can do that. And context for people listening, I, I believe um, what he's alluding to, 35 calendar days after, you know, any type of event, the 35 days is significant because it lines up with uh, the reg show failure to deliver closeout window. So under reg show, which was, you know, a law that was passed to try to combat naked short selling. Um, if a failure to deliver occurs, whoever, you know, failed to deliver the share has 35 calendar days to deliver that share. And so uh, that's not a that's not a, a hard deadline all the time. Like my understanding is that you are able to close out those failures to deliver prior to the thirty fifth day, but legally speaking, it needs to be done by the thirty fifth day. So it's it's kind of a good good thing to keep track of. Although I I think people overemphasize it sometimes. I think people really overemphasize Red Show. And I think also I dropped the. Um, I should have dropped the picture there, maybe. So I just dropped it in the Discord. Okay, perfect. Uh, I see it. Um, it's it's a download link in the Zoom chat. Oh, okay. But in the Discord, it, we can see it. I also, I forgot to add, I'm going to add the this PDF so you guys can all have the, I'll drop it in the Discord as well. The, um, so that you guys can have this data. You can look at it yourself. Let me find, let me know if you do anything, find anything interesting. Let me put it. I am the most unorganized. All right. So yeah, no, that's curious too. Um, but what I'm curious about is where, when you guys looked at these, were you able to figure out if they were long or short? The, the uh, puts themselves? Yeah. No, no. Um, I didn't do such a deep dive into it. No pun intended. Um, I just, I matched up 
the runs to the dates and then tried to see if there were similarities between when they expired worthless and how many days later Jamie Price ran. And then after doing like two or three of them, I was like, oh, wait, this is interesting. They're, mm -hmm. All three of them are 35 days. So I just kept going and I found that all of them were 35 days. And then uh, for the August and November run, I bought Paul's uh, 34 days and made a bunch of 34 days after they expired, made a bunch of money on those runs. Are you looking at trading day? Like I'm looking at your screenshot, it says trading days, or are you using calendar days? Yeah, so it says trading days, but there's also a bubble that says 27, 27 26 trading days is T2 plus calendar 35 days. I see. Mm. It's curious. So 35 calendar days usually ends up being 26 or 27 trading days. But what's curious too gotcha. is that these when was the expiry? Uh, da, 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 or no, I guess that we're gonna we're gonna see that um these get closed. They don't oh, they expire. Do? Okay, that's interesting. Uh yeah, I think I because they their expiry was the 17th. Was the 17th of what? Uh, 2020 0117. 2020 01. I have 20. Oh, that's 2021. Okay, so I'm actually after you. Uh, the first one that I looked at was are these 16 October 2020. 16 October 2020. Okay, yeah. So I focused on these, um, because I, I want it to kind of so that's the lower end of my um data frame that I have. It takes a kind of a lot of processing to directionalize these options. So I had to do it in chunks. Um, so this is the lower end of the data I have available. Plus, I was just always interested in these in these puts as well. Because again, I wanted to just characterize what was happening before things got out of control. Because I think that that helps, you know, put yourself in the shoes of the large institution that has, you know, say 120,000 puts open and now things are not going in your way, like not going your way. Uh, say for like, if you have a massive run up. And so I think it helped, it kind of just helps me figure out what was the foundation of this environment and then build up as things progressed. Uh, but I'm pretty, pretty certain that these were closed. Um, and I'm going to try to, I'm going to see if I can convince you of that in like 30 seconds. So then what I did was I, from the what you mentioned with the reporting dates, the so this is the Melvin, I think Melvin Capital reporting dates. And what I did was I, not the date that they filed, but the effective date are these gold lines, excuse me. And the numbers represent how many puts they said they had open. And you see that, do, 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 do things, there's several interesting findings on this graph. Anyone want to give a second again? Because we're kind of just here informally chatting. Uh, but does anyone see anything that is curious about this? Quote that they said they had open for sure, for sure. The numbers don't seem to add up in some situations. Mm. Or, yeah, am I right about that? It doesn't seem like, like, I mean, no, if we add them together, it's a little different, but. Um... Well, the idea that I was kind of having was two, I think two things kind of became apparent to me. I'm not going to assume that they are lying, right? I'm going to assume that they're probably being creative in what they report, but they, but financial institutions rarely lie. You know, that's why they spend so much work. That's why legalese exists and financial talk exists because no one wants to lie. Right, uh, they're, but, they're technically not lying, Correct, but they may be using very creative language. Correct, but the fact that most people, even large institutions will not outright lie is what we can use against them. And so if they really did have 40,000 here and 40,000 here and 28,000 here, this tells me that someone else owned 60, 80,000 puts, right? Because we, we know how many existed. If they had 20,000 here, 
that tells me that they own some other puts somewhere else because we only have like 10,000 and we have zero for the zero, 50 cents. You see what I mean? But we do see that there is a huge drop, 75 to, we'll say 10, right? So there's a 65,000 put drop here in a single day. And it also just so happens that their numbers in that time period goes from 40,000 to 28,000. So that does suggest that these $1 puts probably were some of the puts that they were reporting. Uh, so the strikes aren't, so this is one of those coincidental. So I, when I look at data, I just kind of pull threads. I just, I put things on top of things, associate things, and does a picture start to form? I was always interested in the one and fifty dollar, one dollar and fifty cent puts, um, because they make no sense. They just don't, um, except later on, especially. But these, in particular, caveat: these do make sense, and we're going to use that against uh, to kind of figure out to scope out their positions. So, in the sense of, is there a reason why I chose these puts specifically? No, but only because I was interested in them. And then when I added on top of the reporting dates, I just noticed that this behavior exists where the 40,000 to, this is really what uh, like caught my interest was 40,000 to 28,000 was a halving of their position count. And we went from 125,000 to 70,000, right? So that's almost like a one for one accounting of the amount of puts that they said they had. There was a gradual rise from 28 to 34. There is, and then this doesn't really match up. So things just kind of start to align. And this is kind of how we can dig in to the data a little bit more. So one of the things that we could do, and again, I didn't want to get too deep. I just kind of wanted to, with this discussion, share how the data could be analyzed to figure out where you need to go start really digging through the files. Because we could easily look at, one of the things I want to look, I would want to look at is which exchange these options went through. Were they flex? Were they over the counter? Were they standard? I, they're, they, obviously they were standard in the, uh, for the one and 50 cent ones. Could we start pinpoint, could we look at all the strikes and start seeing similar behavior? Do chunks of strikes open and close at the same time, right? Does that kind of answer the question? So there was no, I didn't object, like choose the one in dollar and the 50 cent puts for any other reason other than I thought that they were curious. Yeah, so that's the context of the kind of this, the whole discussion is I'm just like going through the data, teasing out what looks interesting and then kind of pulling the thread more. Sometimes we'll come up with cool association, uh, association, uh, why I can't talk. Don't worry, I'm just having a stroke. Uh, associations like this. And sometimes it leads to a dead end and you, you go to the next thread. But I did think it was pretty interesting that the Melvin reporting kind of just followed, especially these three. Kind of just, it, again, I don't, coincidences exist. I just don't trust them. Yeah, I, I'm just, I, I wanted to say this because um, at the very beginning of January of 2020, Wedbush actually, you know, gave a higher estimate than everybody else saying that GameStop should be worth $8 a share instead of Credit Suisse's, you know, $3.50 a share. So I find that a little bit curious too. I don't know what their purpose of that was. Did they legitimately think that or mm. did they want people to, to bag hold if, you know, all these puts were coming in and the price was dropping? Like, I have no idea what the purpose of that uh of that announcement was, but it is, yeah. uh, that is the timeline of, of what happened. Okay. Yeah. Keep that. We'll keep that in the back of my, in the mind, because that's actually interesting. You said in January, January 3rd. Yeah. Let's, I don't want to skip ahead too much. So I'm not going to keep that in the back of your, in your back pocket. So, Oh, sorry. January 14th of 2020. Yeah. Not 2021. 2020. Right. That is curious because that that date neighborhood is going to come up here soon. Um, I'm really enjoying this because again, I don't know 
much about GME. I just dig through the data, I guess. Um, but the next logical question was, okay, maybe, right? Maybe this has an association and maybe we can see uh, this very unique opening and closing of puts. Can we start to ascribe or can we start to tease out what were these puts doing? Why were they being opened? Because my initial thought was that these were being opened to uh, cover shorts, right? My initial thought was just because of the behavior of how they open, that the reporting date is coming up and I need to say that I covered all these shares. So I sell a whole bunch of puts. I'm technically long these shares. Bam, I covered my shorts. And so in that theme, I needed to start to tease out where these dealer long puts, where these dealer short puts. And the easy thing would be to just go into the CSV file and take a look. But I wanted to work through the data again, kind of like if I was in your guys' shoes, how could I start teasing this data out to figure out, um, could I get a glimpse of if this was dealer long or dealer short? So the first thing I did was I did a unadjusted, I looked at the Greeks of these options and I looked at them as they progressed through time. And the idea was if the Greeks were in favor of these options being profitable, well, then maybe they were long options. If these Greeks weren't favorable of them being open or if there seemed to be uh, indiscriminateness to it, then maybe these puts didn't have, they weren't price sensitive. So the idea was there were these options price sensitive or not. And so here it is. Don't mind the negative or positiveness of the Delta. That's just convention. What do you guys think? What do you guys think here? So we see when the options were opened, they had about a delta of 0 0.20. Just prior to them being closed or expired, was the delta closer to zero or closer to negative one? It's closer to zero. So, and also volatility as well, but yeah. So th these were not, um, this was not somebody that was looking to profit, I think. Or, well. Well, they, they lost money on these puts. Asterix, right? did they? Uh, Up until January 13th, this position was a loss. Yes. And then oh. what happened? Hang on, I have the sidebar blocking part of my screen. Let me, see. Let me try mm. to move that. You gotta get the whole picture, you gotta get the whole screen. What happened after the 13th to the delta of these puts? Wow, it just, uh, it changed dramatically right after. Coincidences exist, I do not trust them. So it yeah. seems right two days before expiry, something changed so much so and i the embarrassing part here is i just drew that line with a ruler <laughs> but I think yeah. the but they were drastically underwater until two days before expiry and then something happened to push the delta of those options below the delta that they were purchased at so if these were long puts this now is profitable. So the next question, what would the next question be? Where does your mind go with this? What, what piece of data would you want to look at with this in mind? Well, what affects Delta? On price change. Price change. So how about we look at GME's price? Oh, wait, one last thing before we do that. Remember how the there was like a half closure? So my next question was, with half of this position closed, is this still a profitable position? 
So then what I did was I just multiplied the Greeks by the open interest per day. And that would give us the kind of like uh, a cumulative delta of these options. And we see that indeed f with this new adjustment, the uh, difference is smaller, but it is still a profitable position. So they definitely lost profit uh, if these puts were dealer short. So if they had purchased these options. And again, the assumption is that these are somehow associated with these reporting dates, or they're just someone who, so they're either associated with these reporting dates, or they're part of that entity that we saw above when we were looking at the put behavior of someone who seems to be very apt at timing GME. They're very good at opening and closing these put positions at seemingly the perfect time. And that, that spike is the day after Wedbush maintains their buy rating for GameStop with a price target of $8. That's interesting. Oh, it gets, it gets, even, it, it gets even more fun. It gets even more. Uh, so, because actually that actually is a puzzle that I was missing, a piece of the puzzle that I was missing is that information. The idea that there was a catalyst. This is the stuff that SEC should be looking at, hashtag SEC. I'll give them this for some money. And so there, there is a whistleblower program. If you provide them data, they will pay you. And uh, it's not difficult to fill out. You, you know just what? have to provide the data. Uh, I'll link you after if you're serious. I'll link you. Yeah. If you guys see me on CNBC, if you see me on Jim Cramer's uh, channel, I'll, I'll give a shout out. Um, the Because it is, Harvey. It's like, it remembers, I would never want to leave you guys. That's the thing. The, but you're right, this, where's my, wow, hold on, ooh, oh no, I think I'm going through a tunnel. <laughs> it's, I can't hear you, I'm breaking up. <laughs> like, oh, my speakers are broke, ah. Uh, but you're right, because again, I, I, coincidences happen, but I don't trust them, and then when there were so many in a row, things become, that's when I start to really get head scratchy, right? And that's Conway, that was such a good piece of the puzzle, I'm excited for the so what I did was naturally I looked at the price and the volatility, the two main determining factors in Delta. And what happens two days or three days, or like here, basically I'm just going to point it out. The price plummets. Curious. Now we're on a downward trajectory. Sure. But... Again, just we'll say, co we'll call this, how do you spell coincidence? Coincident. Oh, that's not how this community yeah. spells it. You spelled it correctly, but this is not how we spell it. C-O-H-E-N. Ah. It's a joke. <laughs> Hang on. Somebody's knocking at my door. So yeah. if I don't come back, remember me finally. I like, yeah, right? Because again, it would be one thing if this was like coincidence number two, but it, we're actually not looking at that much data on GME, right? Like we're looking at specifically puts at a specific date range before the squeeze and really looking at two strikes. Yeah, the purge. Send me that um, whistleblower link first before you open the door, please. And so this is such a narrow scope, but already we're seeing we're at, I mean, the spikes alone, that's probably like 10 or 12 coincidences that just seemed really well-timed. And then now we have these, the price drops very serendipitously right before expiry, which just also serendipitously puts the puts into profitability and just enough to account for the options that were closed. I want a 6.9%. All right, well, yeah, well, hit me up after this. And what else is curious about? Anyone want to, anything else curious about? So the, this is close. And the blue line, the teal line is Ivy. Anything else interesting about King Boo? Yeah, that IV spike. Look at this. It's huge. Now, I'm going to do a little bit of a plug. But it, has anyone who wasn't in the live chat, has anyone watched the video on liquidity from the live chat, the last live chat we had? That was a good one. I do recommend, obviously. But I only ask because 
what's unique about like here we'll say like this range but if you if you wanted to you could extend it out but what is the like uniqueness of this liquidity profile and i would say to even if you didn't watch the video if you i did a a, a reddit post on gme's liquidity totally not even on this time frame but it matches the pro it matches what the findings suggest are the state of the current asset and the idea is that price is going up and volatility is going up what does it mean if the price of an asset is rising and liquidity is diminishing If, let's put it this way, if I want to purchase some shares and there's a ton of shares, is liquidity good or bad? Liquidity is good in that situation. Perfect. Right? So if I like, wanna... Yeah. And, and that, would, that would result in a lower IV because, you know, IV is a, is a measure of how smooth the transaction is going, right? Like you said. And... How, uh, and um, it would be easy to obtain the shares and it would be easy to sell the shares in that environment. Correct. Good job. So then what, what does it mean if price is appreciating and liquidity is being removed? It's very difficult to transact in that environment. If you yeah. want to buy, it's harder to buy. If you want to sell, it's harder to sell. So in this environment, are there, is there more bid or is there more ask? more bid with aggressive buyers right exactly in yeah almost exclusively bid right because iv will see i mean iv goes up quite substantially and the price really doesn't move relatively as much but so we know we're in an environment where there's poor liquidity and liquidity becomes very diminished whenever the price appreciates so the first thing I did was I wanted to look at whenever an environment like this exists, I want to know who is providing liquidity. Because the idea is if you can determine who is providing liquidity, well, you can find out where the hell they went. Why did you stop providing liquidity here? What is this massive IV spike? And this was a, I looked a lot of places actually. <laughs> Um, I looked in the dark pools. I looked in the, like the, some other data and I couldn't find liquidity providers. I couldn't find something that had a cohesive framework that would eventually explain the spike. I'm gonna be honest. I couldn't find anything. So then what I did, I have like a. I can go through like what I looked, but essentially couldn't find them. So the next thing I did was I said, well, maybe was maybe this is a noisy signal. Maybe this is a un maybe I'm connecting dots that aren't important. And so I went back to Varex, which is again what I use to discern almost everything on a stock. And I said, this Varex spike happened 2020, January 1st, or it actually, I think was January 2nd. And so I went to the Varex and what did you know? Oops. This told me to keep looking. Varex from this volatility spike plummeted into the propagation zone. It's pretty significant. And Varex has a few liquidity metrics built into it. And so this particular view of liquidity was, it seems, sufficient, Jesus, to move the entirety of Varex. And Varex has quite a few things that plug into it. So I kept looking, kept not finding anything. So finally I said, well, let's build a heat map. Let's see what the options dealers, let's start to segment out explicitly the main players in this market. So I looked at the options dealers and what do you think? I'm, I'm not going to put up. What do you guys think the options, the heat map is going to look like? 
Well, you spoiled it already, so I'm gonna. Oh shit! Yeah, that's right. I showed it. <laughs> All right. <laughs> what is this heat map? That looks like. Well, we have to look at what the net delta exposure is to see if gamma is. Sure, but we just in this it, orientation. It's can... a gamma squeeze. Yeah, this is a Jamie was in a gamma squeeze. And okay, so and we've see, we've we've been seeing a lot of these, not just in GameStop, but like across the entire market lately. Correct, Harvey. And for for people that are interested in GameStop and Ryan Cohen, uh, a, a lot of the stuff that we're talking about now also has uh, relevance to Bed Bath and Beyond. I'm, I'm not recommending you know uh, any stock to any person. It's not you know investment advice. I'm just looking at the data seeing what happened um the volatility discussion that we just had very relevant to bed bath and beyond as well and i think the volatility the, the volatility of gamestop this past week was also very very interesting and I, I hope we talk about that um later on um but this hedging heat map is what we talk about uh with gamma squeezes and and the idea here is that like the crosshairs you see the black crosshairs in the middle that's where price is currently Red means that it's hedging uh, selling pressure. Blue means it's buying pressure. And the reason why we're so interested in gamma squeezes, particularly hedging heat maps that are gamma squeeze, in gamma squeeze orientations, is that if the price goes up, it gets into heavier and heavier buying pressure, which makes the price go up even more. And so that's why you see these parabolic moves up sometimes. And the same thing in the reverse direction, where if you see selling, you see more and more selling and heavier selling pressure, which can cause prices to just drop like a rock. And we've seen that a lot lately with a, a bunch of different things in the stock market. The other curious thing about this hedging heat map is that normally you would see a white zone, which is a gamma neutral zone, which roughly speaking means that you don't really need to do anything. Like if you're a market maker, if you need to hedge your position, you don't really need to do anything because it's still in like this stable neutral gamma zone. There is no white zone on this hedging heat map. So this is like purely a battle between bears and bulls here. Um, and it's a very high stakes one at that. Perfect, thank you. Uh, yeah, so you can see that there's a lot to um, unpack here, right? Uh, and so, to also add to that discussion, uh, again, I wish sharing was easier. My brain grew a wrinkle. There's a few, yeah, there's a few more to, like things to tease out here. Hold on, how do I do I wish you could just copy paste, but you can't, I don't think. Um, one second. I'll put it in Discord. And then uh, I have to save it. This is and then I'll add it here. Cool, it didn't add as a, sorry guys. What is, because did it distro? Because there's also something curious about this. There's the the photo. I don't. I didn't even see it. iPhone. Sorry. <laughs> um. Was a my brain. Where my brain go? The. So this is the do 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 do. This is. This heat map. I forgot. I didn't have the date. Is. Yeah, from here. So 20, 20, 12, 31 is this heat map. And we see that the next day the price goes up. Interesting point number one. And I shared that graph in the this in the um Discord and then here because that graph shows the relevancy of this guy. And you see that if the, uh, man, I wish I could bring it up. Well, let's describe what that is. The thing that um, Justin just, you know, 
Wait, can, a box you do, can you help explain that while I try yeah, to get yeah. this picture on my thing, Madrid? Sure. So that's what we refer to as the influence distribution. Oh, you're sharing your camera and then not the screen, just so, so you know, Justin. Um, but anyway, the influence distribution, it kind of shows um, what the statistically significant um, price behavior is going to be. So we really only want to look at the biggest spike. And in that influence distribution, which we can no longer see because Justin is uh, showing his lovely face to us instead, <laughs> um, is the biggest spike was in the red area. And so statistically speaking, the pressure should be to the downside in that situation. But that, you know, there are other spikes around. Um, okay, perfect. We see the, we see the picture now. Thank you for that. The, so as Conway said, this, these spikes tell us where the statistically significant movement is going to be. And based on the shades of the color, what the likely magnitude of that movement is. And then if we look at the total totality of that data, so we look at, so this is from one of the weekly chats where we combed the entire market, calculated all those spikes for every heat graph and then looked at the future price return uh, for a stock. And we see that negative one, which is, I can't draw on Dropbox, but the on the left, we see that if you have around a negative one distribution heat map, your change in price for the next day is statistically negative. It's below the red dash line. So it's curious. So two things, again, adding to the, the pile of coincidences. Ooh, hold on, where's, yeah, okay. Adding to the pile of coincidences, we now know that on the 31st of December, the data was showing us that there was a statistical association with um, moving to the downside. And to add to that, those spikes don't account for the fact that the crosshairs were already in selling pressure. So this combination is a pretty potent combination for downside. If I could draw, do you ever think I could draw? I think it's a skill I'm gonna learn. This is a pretty potent combination. I, in seeing this on any stock, am entering short positions. You know. Uh, fun fact, you know, on Thursday, which was the day after GameStop reported earnings, <laughs> we were sitting in buying pressure. In, in fact, we were sitting in like medium, decently strong buying pressure. Mm -hmm. And the, I believe the influence distribution was also positive. And you know, I, I don't think it'll be to anybody's surprise here. It didn't actually do what we thought it was going to do. Instead of actually buying, causing more buying because of a gamma squeeze heat map orientation in the pre-market, basically as soon as the market opened at 4 a.m., price just started um, dropping. So if anybody was holding calls overnight, I'm not going to point any fingers. <clears throat> um, you lost money, unfortunately. And on top of that, implied volatility dropped off of a cliff. Yeah. And so your, your contracts lost value there too. Um, we can talk about ways to mitigate all of that stuff, but that's probably outside of the scope of this conversation. I just want people to know what happened. And like, you know, if you're not monitoring volatility, it is something that I do think that everybody needs to be monitoring if you're going to be playing options in general, not just on GME. You know, for sure. Uh, Cause I think what was interesting, Harvey, did they write it off the lit market? Probably. The, what's interesting too about the most recent, um, I don't know who the fool was that bought out of the money calls on Jimmy, uh, but the drop in liquidity, if we remember also, you know, there are certain ways if you do need to move a stock, you can, if you're a market maker, right? You can move the price or you can move, you can manage liquidity. And remember from the heat map, the massive drop in liquidity actually brought GME to like the relative like selling pressure and then i think it recovered it eventually bounced back into the in their purchasing support and like took off but the damage done to whoever's calls those were uh by liquidity by IV dropping the IV crushes too much but when you look mapped out the movement of the crosshairs from IV, you saw that it was pointed through and immediately moved gme without having to move the price that much through gamma neutral and then rested it right on to selling pressure, which was pretty interesting. Again, coincidence number 9,600 and some 
on GME. But all of this to say that statistically, the price should have gone down. Sometimes statistics work against us. And so the next day, the price went up. Okay. But also remember the next day when the price went up, we had this huge, 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 like my hand, increase or decrease in, in liquidity, a huge increase in IV. But this, so this made me pause. Why did, Conway, why did this make me pause? Why was I curious? Oh, wow, you can draw lines. How did I do that? Anyway, never again. The idea is what, there's something that is a general rule when it comes to stocks and gamma squeezes. Uh, normally, a stock entering a gamma squeeze most likely goes down, not up. Uh, most likely goes down, not up. But also, they typically experience artificial liquidity. So this is a fun uh, thread that I pulled because the launch from neutral, what do you mean, iPhone 11 Pro Max? The, I'll wait for a response, or I anticipate, but... um. Typically, stocks in a, in a gamma squeeze will experience artificial liquidity. So IV drops like a lead weight, and even if the price goes down. And so it kind of worked against the, oh yeah, here it is. So from the gamma squeeze primer, we see that if we divide out a stock based on how many total days it lasted in a gamma squeeze, and then we looked at every day of that gamma squeeze. So for instance, this box are stocks that were in a gamma squeeze for nine days. And then we looked at every day. We see one of the findings that we saw was not only did the price typically go down, we see that uh, all these lines until the recovery phase, recovery, the price goes down and volatility goes down. Who isn't, <laughs> right? So I was curious if, but we also see that if the price goes up, volatility goes up after the recovery phase. So, okay, we can say that because maybe it, GME at this time, it was definitely in a gamma squeeze. It experienced a spot up IV up moment, which is associated with an increase in IV. But was that an appropriate movement in IV? How would we answer that? So I, I just want to repeat what you said, but in, in different words, just to make sure that everybody following along is, is, is getting it. Um, when you say spot up IV up, you mean spot price. So whatever the price of the stock is, IV up would be implied volatility up, AKA liquidity down. Um, and to, to try to kind of understand the situation, would it be accurate to say that under normal circumstances, this is not specific to GME right now, but under normal circumstances, when you see price dropping and liquidity um, becoming more liquid, so, so IV would be down, it's kind of like the, the idea here is that maybe it's some panic selling. People are willing to, to sell because they don't want to lose any more money and, and somebody's buying at the bottom, providing that liquidity on the buy side. Um, and so that's what normally happens in a gamma squeeze situation where the price goes down and liquidity um, increases. Yeah, correct, right? So like price spot down, the classical teaching in the market is spot down is always associated with an increase in IV. And the idea is that not only is the price maybe moving more than it usually does, which increases volatility, but also as more people enter the market to sell, it becomes harder to find buyers, right? Eventually, even prospective buyers are going to be like, the stock is, I don't know where the stock's drop is going to end. So I'm, I'm going to remove my bid. And now you have a, a situation where your sellers greatly outnumber your buyers and volatility increases. 
Right. So uh, just your first drawing, dollar plus IV plus, is, is that what you meant to draw? You said spot down. You put well, dollar. that's like the classic situation, right? Oh, in, okay, a, okay. in a gamma squeeze, when you have spot down, IV down, this is because the sellers are price insensitive. Yeah, just get me out now. I don't want to lose any more money. Well, or remember the predominance of the price action on stocks in a gamma squeeze are from hedgers. I don't know why I just wrote price side. Gotcha. And hedgers are price insensitive. So they will always go to the next bid, no matter where it's at, because they their obligation is to hedge their positions and not to participate in price discovery. Right. So, so and that's why okay. we call it artificial liquidity. Because as soon as their positions are fully hedged, artificial liquidity, and they remove that indiscriminate, that price insensitive bid, you see the large increase in volatility. It's like a whip shot because now there are no bid or right. Yeah. There's right. Yeah. So, so oh God. Th this would be just uh, hedgers slamming market orders and just hitting the bid, right? Just like selling aggressively. Yeah. Being price just... indiscriminate. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. They just, they're, they don't care about the price. You could drop the price down to zero. They don't care. They just, they have a, depending on the Delta or the gamma on their books, they know how many shares they have to purchase or sell. And especially in higher uh, volatile environments, when hedging starts to become very active, they're not just doing the like single or two day um, and their obligation stops when their hedge fund picks up the ball that as well, or they just exit the position, right? Like they take counter counter options to, just kind of neutralize themselves. Uh, but eventually the idea is that at some point they are going to make the decision either by means of their portfolios being relatively what they can, within their risk compliance or some other aspect, but they're going to stop providing that artificial liquidity. They're going to stop providing that price indiscriminate purchasing or selling. And so that artificial liquidity is going to immediately get sapped from the market. And so whereas, and these are these moments where everyone is like, the price has gone down, but IV has gone down. Or, you know, like the bid and the bid and the spread is like sub, sub penny, but the price is tanking. Well, this is probably because the price insensitive actors are still performing their price insensitive dance. And as soon as they stop, that's when things get real fun. But the question still was, one, kind of, unfortunately hard to still to figure out if a stock is in the, its recovery period. So we can't really say, all right, we would anticipate, you know, cause Jimmy's on day nine, that they're probably on the recovery phase. So a price up, IV up situation would be appropriate. The, even though again, statistically the stock should have gone down, but wait, Conway, didn't you say, you said something. The which date was the announcement of the eight dollar share price? The January fourteenth of twenty twenty. Uh, and and yeah. on the on the fifteenth, um, okay. yeah, we on the fifteenth we saw the delta on those puts that before were trending towards being worthless suddenly spike and we're worth something again. Right. Okay, I just wanted to. So it was the fourteenth. I wanted. I was curious if that was closer to here. But that's fine. The so statistically, the stock should have gone down. Um, it didn't go down. It went up. It did experience a decrease in liquidity, which is somewhat reasonable if we assume that GME was in this recovery phase of its uh, uh, gamma squeeze. But then I kind of started thinking, well, how do we? We could prospectively go and look at when GME ended its gamma squeeze, and that would tell us which day it was on. But that felt like cheating. Neutral margin, UMR is starting this month. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like there's several, like I think, uh, external events that could definitely influence. Uh, but I didn't want to cheat, right? I wanted to kind of like pretend like this was in the moment. I'm looking at this data. It's 2020 again, un you know, unfortunately. So what I did was I went back into the data on the gamma squeeze and I collected 35,000 points of daily percent change of the closing price and of IV. 
the what's UMR iPhone 11 Pro Max the so 35 individual instances of daily gamma squeeze activity and a, to, and it matches what we anticipated where anytime price goes up IV also goes up the but with this what's curious about this and why the raw data was helpful was now we can in something i don't usually do but we can model this i stay i shy away from models but i felt like this in this point it was curious because i wanted to know what is the likelihood lee wow forgive me this cannot be inspiring confidence likelihood of such a large movement so, such a <laughs> right because again this was an obscene increase in iv over a relatively not large increase in movement could you just become an like an investment advisor that way you just um you know stop. maybe if i finish paying off my bills for next month all right well you know the, and then the month after that <laughs> so the model so looking at the thirty-five thousand points it does say iv up spot up is reasonable to do but let's model it so i used a simple uh just like an additive uh smooth mean model nothing fancy it just looks at all the data and gives out a, fan, a pretty standard line, similar to the one in the graph. Then, so I gave it all the data, and then I simply gave it the change in the percent change in the price of those two days, 3.28%. And it spit out an anticipated IV increase of 10%. So in this regard, we know that the model is capturing the uh, hopefully, right, the entire 35 some thousand data points that I fed into it. But then we realize how much the change of IV actually was, which I have written down here. I have it in my head, but I kind of just want to see it again. 150%. So IV increased 150% when the model that was fed with 35,000 data points on the daily change. Of price and IV showed us that uh, it would be within a 95% confidence interval, a 10% increase in IV. <laughs> How are you drawing on the screen? <laughs> I didn't know that was possible, but yeah, LOL. Uh, 12821, that's when I got in. How do things look after one? We're going to look at uh, some more like long term. Uh, we're going to move from this time period here soon. Okay. So this is a 175% difference in between the anticipated value. Can you erase that? Is that possible? Is it on that page or is it everywhere? Oh, there you go. Cool. I didn't know you could write on it. That's cool. But that's 175% difference. And so the next step I was going to do was I was going to look at um, what is like the Z-score, right? Like what is the... Um, probability but i think with 175 percent difference we can assume that it's close to zero percent right the probability of achieving 150 percent increase when you expect 10 percent no again this isn't like the most sophisticated model because again i'm just looking at what was going on here and this is why it became this is really when it became disheartening that i wasn't able to find like the source of liquidity and thus where that liquidity went uh because the this change in volatility was so significant. But if you put it all together, what picture does that paint? And again, if we, if we take it all the way back, we're looking at puts, we looked at the two and the $1 puts, and then we wanted to say, hey, can we figure out if these puts are long or short? Don't even, can you not do that? Can you erase that? Thank you. The so what does this tell us about the state of affairs of this stock? 
Mm. Or what assumptions, what inductions can we start to make? How about, it seems very clear to me that down, price spot down was the goal. Great. 120 some thousand, right? How many of those puts? 120, almost 120, right? Am I, yeah, 120,000 puts open up here. They lose value. And especially on any day with a spot up, liquidity immediately goes away. And then a very serendipitous drop in price finally brings those puts just profitable. So that was the takeaway. That was not to be anticlimactic, but I felt like this was interesting because it showed us a lot of things kind of fall in line with this vantage point. And this is leading up, obviously, to the big movement. Because now we can kind of situate ourselves where there is a price sensitive party. And that price sensitive party does seem to be profitable when the price goes down. And if, because again, I don't typically do the tinfoil hat, but with so many seemingly coincidental coincidences, this also, what is, what, if you want it to be full on, so this is what we have kind of, this is our lemma, or like this is our theory. So then what does, if the price goes up right before these options are expiring, we have two very coincidental inc incidences. Thank you, iPhone 11. I was trying to like work my way to who has the power to do this? Harvey, that's no, Harvey and iPhone, 100% correct. 100%. The idea is someone is helping these puts, right? Perhaps we are anticipating a decline in price, or we maybe we are anticipating giving a little bit of an extra push, maybe a little push. And then now we see the prices appreciating. So we immediately slam the faucet of liquidity down. You cannot get shares. So like if your bid is a thousand or a stock that's $10, right? But there are no, no one is selling there, you know, for various reasons, the value of the asset isn't a thousand dollars. So you can indirectly cap a stock's kind of price by move my manipulating liquidity and this is granted a little tinfoily but there, there's a lot of coincidences here and so it would be advantageous if there was some sort of option dealer market maker association <laughs> let alone a, yeah that's true but what do you guys think? Am I hand wavy, mad hatter? Yeah. Or look, you are preaching to the choir. We love tinfoil around here, but uh, this puts numbers to what we already kind of intuitively felt. And this isn't even the tip of the iceberg, really. Like we see strange stuff happen all the time, yeah. which we haven't even gotten to yet. So yeah. I'll mute and let you continue. No, I mean this is because so. And that's really what I wanted here is I wanted to kind of just give you my perspective and the data that I found interesting because I knew that you guys would have a better understanding of just the ecosystem that Jamie found itself in. It could be, right? And that's the thing is like, it could be one person with super perfect timing, opening up 120,000 puts, <laughs> perfectly timed, right? But because, but again, like this association, because the person or the entity that can control both the price and liquidity is a market maker. And the option 
in this large institution, I shouldn't say option dealer, this institution seems very, that opened up like the 120 puts. So we saw that those puts historically are very well timed. And we're starting to see maybe, and we haven't even looked at all these other spikes, but maybe that timing is this, right? Maybe what we see is really well timed is in, is only post hoc well timed after some assistance. Because again, the whole pre, like the whole assumption, the foundation is that if these two incidences didn't occur and the price would probably just kind of do its thing, then we would probably say that this was a price insensitive party that just sold those puts or are using those puts to uh, do something else. Or if the delta value or the Greeks of these options were basically zero or up here, you know, then we know that those are used on paper for something else than maybe than just profitability. But we do just have this very coincidental profit, like just squeezing out a profit, just preventing the price from appreciating, even though it's in a gamma squeeze. And not only is it in a gamma squeeze, all of the squiggly bops said it should go down. So there was active resistance, a very nice coincidental, huge drop in price. Very profitable, very nice, very profitable. Right, this, and again, I'm just here to kind of show you how, or like how I kind of just comb through data. And then, you know, I would, if I was interested, I would probably pick one of these coincidences and really start digging into it. Very legal, very cool, very standard. <laughs> the standard part is true. All right, so that's, that, oh, yep, we talked about the Vogue spike, then Gamma Squeeze, IV, we looked at the model, 35,000 data points. We saw that it had almost a near zero. So then I, core, then I wanted to look at the, just end a final nail in the coffin. Oh, cause so everything before was kind of data that we could look at with just standard data other than like the Gamma Squeeze stuff. Then I said, well, what if, you know, a, a premium member has this raw data, so the directional data, what, what could they see with that? Uh, and so immediately we see if we map out the same as above, it's just tiny because of how big up here gets, uh, but we see the $1 and, and the 50 cent puts. And then we map out the assumption that these are out of the money puts. We see, very nice. This gets a little messy. Obviously it's the run up, but this I feel like is the kingpin. So the the if that's the expression uh harvey that's true and that's what we're going to get at though is because we can see these trends in real time actually but we and that's why i think working through this is helpful because we can set the foundation of sorts i'm always about setting the foundation like before you go to the figure like you know before you look at today's data you kind of need a reference point to figure out if today's data is significant if it is what does it typically mean so on and so forth and is there a reason behind it so if we literally, if we look at just the out of the money put options, we almost see pretty conclusive evidence that this spiking occurs with these puts. Right, you kind of just need a, a baseline. Line to me. Don't know what that means. And so these, and so there's a nice correlation there. Then I wanted to look at the change in the, I'm gonna just skip it. No, I can't. The change again, so this is a, this one's a little tricky. This is a standardized, uh, I'm going to call it a relative amount. Because if I tell you that, so this is a standardized relative amount of every type of option on GME. And the reason it's standardized, as we saw before, because it lets us see the outliers, but the reason I made it relative to one another, oh, it's a TV show. I thought, I thought it sounded familiar, um, is that it lets you discern, it lets you compare every party to each other at the same time. So essentially what I did was every day I add up all of the options and then I divide each number of option by the total number of options. So you can see, is there one group of options that is expanding or contracting greater than another group? And 
we see that the, and this is just to look at another view of the short out of the money puts. And we see 40, this kind of gets a little messy over here, but 40, 40, and then it drops to 28, goes to 20. So the idea is that it follows the relative trend. And that's all this graph really says. Another vantage point. But we are going to note that there is a curious um, behavior. I'm going to, I guess, draw like this. No real way to draw it. And we're going to keep that in our back pocket. So the take home points here. Wow. Hey, zoom out. So the, I'm pretty confident that the $1 and the 50 cent puts were dealer short. These puts were seemingly very well-timed. There does seem to be a cooperative counterparty the, that can help adjust both liquidity and price action in order to clench a profitability of these puts. And the very, the liquidity profile is telling me that even in 2019, 2020, there was a very limited share supply. There was a, either a very limited willingness to uh, give shares to the market or there were few shares to give to the market. And that's just because of how many times we saw a spot up, IV up moment. And that's the data dive for you guys before we move on to the current data. Um, any, how'd you guys feel? Any questions, any comments? Um, sorry if that's big, I feel like maybe but I thought it was interesting. And I think that it provides a lot more, um, definitely, I mean, I think that there's a lot of threads you could pull even with these data. Very, yeah, thank you. Okay, as long as you guys found it interesting, found it helpful. And also, you know, I think maybe getting some inspiration, some ideas of how you guys can dig through this data. There's probably so much going on in this stuff that, I mean, I know I couldn't get it somewhere in my head. I'm sorry about that. The idea is lots of weird stuff happening in early 2020 on GME. And this weird stuff was happening before the run-up in price. And I don't, so I'm going to be honest, I don't go into the run-up in price. I was going to try to characterize the environment and boy, did it get tricky. Uh, the like this area alone starts to get very messy. Thank you, Bart. But one day I would like to revisit this area, but I wanted to focus on this area. And I think nonetheless, we do, I feel like that's pretty reasonable. And I think a comment earlier on, someone said it's like, it's almost impossible to prove definitively, but I kind of think that this is as close as you can get, if I'm being honest. I mean, we can see this correlates with loan data very closely. That's cool. I love that. That is what's so cool is that this data correlates with so much other stuff. Very cool. The another thing that I noticed, this was, I forget why I was looking at 1018, 2020. I'm going to be honest. Was it, I don't know if 1018, like this area, just before, maybe I was looking at just before the run up in price. I can't remember. But I noticed, I would, and then one of the areas that totally distracted me is I looked at the options layout for 1018 and immediately noticed the in the money puts. $2.50 deep in the money puts, right? So obviously I couldn't let that go. In the money puts for anyone who may not be too, um, uh, you know, in the options, it is almost always financially better, for lack of a better word, to exercise in the money puts prior to expert. And it's just another one of those like market wisdoms. And there's some math behind it. But the idea is that if your option is in the money, you can simply exercise them take a profit. The idea is just take your profit. And then if you want, reopen the position. Very rarely do we see uh, deep in the money options puts last till expiry. 
So that's why that caught me off guard because there was a lot of deep in the money puts. So what I did was I looked again at when they were opened, when they were closed, and then I colored the line based off of when they were in the money and when they were out of the money. And obviously the out of the money corresponds, uh, there was a huge jump in out of the money at the start of the run-up just because the price was appreciating so much. But we can see very clearly that there was both a increase in these puts when they were already in the money. And then the moment they became out of the money, they dropped off a lead weight. They dropped off a lead weight. That's where I'm at right now, guys. <laughs> they dropped like a lead weight. I, I want to add a little bit of context here as well. Um, there have been people on social media talking a lot about selling puts lately. And some of the more prominent people who have been particularly vocal about it have publicly stated that they sold deep in the money puts, or at least that they are, they're deep in the money now. I was, um, you know, out of curiosity, I was looking at them. I don't know when they opened the position, you know, when they wrote, uh, when they sold to open the position. But last week, <clears throat> when GameStop fell down to $23.50, the deltas on those strikes were like 75, which, I mean, that's risky. It's extremely risky. So it kind of ties into what Justin was just saying that like, you know, it's always financially better to exercise deep in the money puts before expiration. Um, so be careful out there. As a point of reference, um, if you watch Tasty Trade on YouTube, um, they teach people how to sell options. And the general rule of thumb for them is, is if you're just, you know, uh, and I could be wrong on this. So don't, you know, this is not financial advice at all. Just do some more research into this. 30 deltas, like 0.3 is kind of what they go for. And they monitor that position and they roll it if necessary. Mm. And the sort of rough rule of thumb, again, it's not perfect, but it's a, like a rule of thumb is like, you could use Delta kind of as a proxy for like a statistical likelihood of <clears throat> something being profitable or not. So if you're selling a 30 Delta option, you've got roughly a 70% chance of making money on it, roughly a 30% chance of losing money on it. And so when some people were talking about selling puts that were 75 deltas, what it meant was that there was a 75% chance of losing money and a 25% chance of making money. At that point, I don't consider that personally, right? My personal opinion on it, I don't consider that responsible investing behavior anymore. You're gambling. And if the person you sold the put to decides to exercise, then you're just giving money away. So be careful about some of the things that you see online. Um, we all know that there are bad actors out there and they encourage bad behavior. So be careful out there. Mm -hmm. This is a good point. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Selling um, seven, like 0.75 Delta seems obscene to me, especially puts. Um, yep. So little, so good points and that's why that's also what makes these so strange right like these were opened in the money so naturally i i'm not gonna we're not gonna do the whole shtick that we just did before i just went right to the data and i said all right these opened on i think it was 2026.4 so i looked right at the data went to 2026.4 and oops wow in front of me and i still can't do it we see a nice jump in the in the money short puts. So these were these puts were indeed purchased. I'm just curious. But again, if we reflect upon where this stock was and the behavior uh, like of the participants on this stock, which was price sensitive, anticipating downside, then purchasing in the money puts makes sense because they have a relatively high delta, a delta of almost one. So it's essentially shorting the stock. So I thought that was curious. That's all for that. <laughs> yeah, that's not. So any questions on the past behavior? Any comments, concerns? And then we'll go through the how the data looks now. 
And we're mostly just going to do that. We're going to look at some the how the options are looking. We can like clearly see like some stuff going on. Um, and then we're going to look at the, re the report components. And that should be it for now. Any questions? All right. So let's see, how does it look today? The Varks graph, so I always start with Varks. Again, it's kind of like my uh, compass. And barring the random change in data recently, we do see that the, is it five? One, two, three, four, yep, the five month. So I've always kind of noted that Varks has this weird, unique five month cycle where we see these Varks spikes. And we see that we are now entering the um, this next stage of the five month and not to get too many people too excited, but we do see that the commencement or the progress of this five, mo five month cycle is typically a price appreciatory event. So that's what Varks is telling me that maybe something is on the future. If this cycle holds, the problem with cycles and patterns is they are good as long as they are good. So unfortunately, until Varex starts to skyrocket, we won't is we don't can't really say for certain if the cycle is going to continue. But it is there. If we look at the and then I just wanted to look at the five dollar and the zero point five dollar puts and they're back. We saw that kind of hinted at above. I didn't crop the dates well enough. So this punch, this punch is a little less, but curious that they're back. And what's also curious is why are they the same amount? So the, did I, I don't know if I included it in here. I didn't. So what I did then was I quickly just looked at the Greeks of these options and they're essentially all zero, which is curious. So, which is a different environment from when they opened previously. So like Delta is zero. I think Vega was the only one that had like some value other than zero. Gamma was essentially zero because I mean, they're $2 or they're 50 cent puts on a stock that's nowhere near 50 cents. So I thought that was curious, but I also did think, uh, no. So some green, some food for thought. The looking at those puts, uh, what type they were, we see uh, da, da, da. we see that they open up just before 801. So we go here just before 801, we see a massive spike in the out of the money short puts. So these are indeed dealers short puts. So someone did purchase a whole bunch of these puts. So did they roll over to reset the end date of the put? Maybe, I'm gonna be honest, I didn't really look at it. It was just kind of one of these like interesting, I usually don't look at uh, like the day-to-day -day options changes, but um, it was just curious because of, again, like I only chose these puts because I found, I just thought their existence was curious to begin with. I really didn't anticipate um, them being here again <laughs> or what that, uh, or the fact that they also do seem to also be dealer short. Do we know the expiration on those puts or no? Um, so I could have sworn, I asked myself that this morning when I was preparing and I could have sworn that in the money, no, 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 that I had that down somewhere, but I do not see it in my notes, but I swear that I did write that. Oh, yes. I, it was January 7th, I think, 2023. Because that, that struck me as odd, too, was that the, these also expired the first week of January, or the first week of January of the next year. Right? And then these are one year. And this is one year. And so the expiry is always for the next year, January. Not always, but of these instances. So another point of investigation could be if we wanted to tease out the behavior of 
the the options flows during the initial run up in uh, 2021. Uh, I would look not only I would look for these puts again, and then I would also look, or I guess around here, for puts that expire in 2021 of January. Hot potato liability change hands. Yeah, well, it's weird because it's that's what struck me, and that's why I that's why I remembered looking at the dates because I remember being surprised, and now I just remembered why. It's because they almost they almost were the exact same expiry, but next year first week in january first friday in january the other interesting thing is that you said that gamestop voic seems to be on a five month cycle um well, a couple things there um well all right let's just talk about the five month cycle sure the the next cycle kind of places us at around that expiration i think on friday or maybe thursday I saw an alert on Twitter saying that somebody had entered a large put position in GME with size, nearly a million dollars in premium. Um, I forget the strikes. I think it was the $25 strike puts maybe. I, I can't remember. I'll have to go back and check. Right. Um, it was black box stocks on Twitter. If not that account, then one of the related accounts like Money Flow Mel or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was a little curious because the timing kind of lines up a little bit there too. And also that spike of puts that you had just mentioned kind of puts us into that January time frame as, as well. The yeah. second thing I wanted to mention, and you know, a couple months ago, we noticed an enormous spike in VOEX in GME. And now that is no longer there. In fact, this spike in VOEX was so huge, it was actually even bigger than January of 2021 mm -hmm. by a significant margin. And yeah. strangely, or at least to me, a little bit strangely, um, GME didn't really move up that much. It moved up a little bit, but it was far overshadowed by the movements that we saw in um, you know, somewhat associated stocks, such as Bed Bath & Beyond, most notably, mm -hmm. and um, AMC as well. AMC had like announced their APE offering or something like that. And so while those stocks and other stocks also kind of moved up together, GameStop didn't move up nearly as much as I was imagining it could have with such a large spike in BOEX. Yeah. Now, the interesting thing about that too, and this is where we get into the tinfoil, and this is where, you know, Justin, I'm very surprised that you're not in the tinfoil camp yet, <laughs> because on one random day, I think it was a Thursday, two, two weeks ago, or maybe three weeks ago at this point, um, Justin, correct me if I'm wrong, but your data providers weren't providing data, right? Yeah, and exactly. it affected a lot of people. Yeah. One of the, like, NASDAQ plugs, plugs, uh, there was a data outage, and it ended up corrupting a lot. It was such an unforeseen thing. Like, the deep dives has a lot of contingency plans, and uh, most data streams, if possible, have backups. Uh, this wasn't one of them because it's almost like you don't anticipate like the floor of your house just falling out, right? And so, it, unfortunately, it corrupted a whole bunch. And then so I had to go back, pull out the, the broken data, and then had to, like, so then when the stream was back up, essentially had to pull the data anew. And as Comrade was saying, the giant VOEX spike that was, I think, here? Yeah, right about Um the data, the Vox was no longer seeing those, the data that would provoke such a, a spike. The, yeah, and I do, I mean, the reports are still made. So we have the, the reports that were made when that data, data existed and the Vox spike is obviously there. But the, again, unfortunately, it was one of those things where I have backups of backups so that I do still have that data plugged away, but it's stored in a backup. And now it's one of those questions of like, which data do I believe? You know, so, so which data do you believe the old data or the new post corrupted data data? The problem, so I don't trust coincidences, but also Occam's razor just says I trust the data that I have currently, right? Like, I just have to. Like, you can, if I feel like if you start 
assigning kind of these subjective assignments to the validity of data, you start to remove yourself from the objectiveness of using data. And that's why I'm so yeah. non tinfoil hattish. Um, it is a very odd instance. It is a very odd occurrence but I will always move forward with the data that I currently have, if that makes sense. That's fair, that's fair. You know, um, um, and, yeah, like and if, for reference to, to people, like we all tweeted about it too. Like if you ser <laughs> search for uh, Justin's account on Twitter, underscore deep dive stocks, and then type in GME yeah. Voex doing a thing, you'll see a screenshot of what that looked like. Yeah. Um, I remember that one very clearly. So if you yeah, wanna have a look. a pretty significant, um, because that was also remember when all three, it was Jimmy, BBY, and AMC, all three on that day spiked. Vox had yeah. on all three stocks spiked. And I said, because I tweeted, I was like, oh, it looks like the, and I was a day or two days before they then ran up like a hundred and some percent. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was an obscene uh, amount, but um, yeah, because Vox spiked on all three, which I found odd. Yeah, GameStop never spiked 100%, but the others um, did have very, very large movements, larger than GME. Yeah, did, I expect, I, I thought that was odd too that GME didn't move that much. Um, so the, for some reason, those dollar and 50 cent puts are back, uh, super far out of the money, seem to also coincide with an increase in the dealer's short put. The So we can assume that a lot of that is coming from here. The so which is the 50 cent puts. The snap graphs, which take Vorex, and that way sometimes I'm a little hand wavy. So developed the snap algorithm to analyze Vorex. And it gives us based off of the gold line where the projected price movement is. And we see that on the 10 day, which is two weeks, so 10 trading days, we have positive anticipated movements. Five days, we see positive anticipated movements. And on the one day, we also see positive anticipated price movements. The 20 day, unfortunately, though, is still negative. But if we saw, I'd be curious if we looked at the previous one, if we wouldn't see the crosshairs like moving towards more positive outlooks. The heat map, the hedging heat map, several very curious findings. The first is that Jimmy isn't a gamma squeeze. Okay. We see that denoted with negative, and we see that it is in the crosshairs are touching purchasing support, so it's touching that blue. And we see the peak of the influence distribution is positive as well. That's pretty exciting. Is this now? Is this, this is today? Yeah. yeah, this is uh the data print from Friday. the all of the all of this stuff is the data print current. from Friday. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. And we see that, but again, this is a very similar heat map to earlier in the week when liquidity dropped 150 something. Like it dropped. It was it was points. absurd. <laughs> that was ridiculous. That move. That that was Thursday morning. Right. And if you pull up, yeah, if you pull up Wednesday Wednesday night's report, you'll see it. Um, yeah, because it moved the stock this way. And even the price actually appreciated during it. So it moved the stock this way. And it was literally almost exactly the same. It rested it there because I the selling pressure moved and like you get more selling pressure if there's more liquidity. What are the numbers at bank from the bottom? Which one, Harvey? I'm sorry. Oh, at the bottom of the hedging heat map, that's the implied volatility. Yeah. So we have the 0.82. Yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah. So the, the heat map just tells us based off how volatility changes and then how the price changes, what the hedging environment looks like. 0.82. That's um, the volatility. Yeah. 0 and, and this is, this is why I personally stress keeping track of volatility is that, you know, most people, they just keep track of price because, you know, it's the most obvious thing to look at. But the reality of it is that hedging requirements can change based on implied volatility. This mm -hmm. particular heat map may not be the best example, but sometimes we'll see stocks that are kind of 
they don't really care about the price necessarily. They care more about the implied volatility. And it could be like, if implied volatility drops, <clears throat> you enter into pretty significant selling pressure or buying pressure. Um, whereas if implied volatility increases, uh, you know, the other thing happens. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, That's why yeah. I'm always like curious about, you know, a lot of people will share, you know, gamma profiles and, but they never include volatility. And it kind of just, this is like a whole nother rant, but if you're, using anything to do with greeks and you don't appreciate the fact that you have to have volatility associated with that then i kind of just immediately assume that you if you knew what volatility's influence was you would never not include it the this is a yeah this is a we'll call this like a proprietary but the idea is similar to uh iv30 or implied volatility 30. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to match perfectly. Like, for example, if you're a Fidelity user, you often don't get the implied volatility metric for some reason. Fidelity just seems to have problems with reporting it. But if you're using Thinkorswim, which, you know, is TD Ameritrade, um, that's a lot more reliable. And you just kind of look at the direction of it, like the way it's moving. The numbers don't have to necessarily match up to what Deep Dive Stocks is reporting. It's pretty close to what Thinkorswim is reporting. Um, I'm not recommending anybody move their money over to, to Thinkorswim necessarily, but the software is free. It's very powerful. It is very useful. Yeah. And so I always have my brokerage app open and Thinkorswim open at the same time yeah. and Bookmap and you know yeah. a bunch of other things. So yeah, it's, 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 it's like useful. moving, like I'm moving towards the groundwork is being laid for live data on the, the data dashboard. And part of that will be like, uh, actual like volatility numbers so we don't have to keep like looking at think or swim to get a gauge for volatility is increasing or decreasing but but this heat map positive um it's we're on the blue we see a peak in the like one in the blue so all of this is indicative uh like statistically significant for up and, what, and what's cool, though, about like having this data is, say, another Thursday happens, say the price goes up and volatility drops, right, which will very serendipitously push us just like it did on Thursday, very close to selling pressure. What do we know now about stocks and a gamma squeeze that experience a price appreciatory event? Volatility should go up. 30, this is 35,000 data points. Why would GME be any different? And so we see, and it's just something to keep in mind because of exactly what Thursday happened. Because we're in a gamma squeeze, we should move in this direction is what the, is what the numbers are telling us. And so, if, and I actually now with this in mind, I didn't actually look at Thursday's heat map. Um, but I think there's a gamma, or GME was in a gamma squeeze as well. So it was, that yeah. also like kind of tells us something was odd about that. Yeah, Wednesday and Thursday are particularly interesting for this discussion. I mean, you're showing Fridays, but for, for people who sub, um, or maybe we can share it on Twitter since it's past mm -hmm. data. Yeah, yeah. Um, Wednesday and Thursday heat maps are very, very interesting. And to kind of get a better sense for it, definitely pull up a chart of GameStop to look at what the price did, particularly in the pre-market. Like Thursday morning, 4 a.m., 7 a.m., yeah. all the way up to 9.29 a.m. Man, if you look at the hedging heat map, you wouldn't believe your eyes as to what happened. Yeah, it was all very, again, added onto the pile of coincidences that seemed to plague Jim. Uh, so the heat map, positive. The options which i found odd were because that twenty dollars popped up and both the twenty dollar call and puts got closed which i found odd so this is the static options graph so it just tells us the layout the current layout and then this is the options change and if the bars are gold it means that that's the those strikes got closed if the bars are blue it means that those strikes were opened. And so, yeah, we see quite an inordinate amount of options closed. 
and a lot of and if uh, if it goes to two hundred percent, like these, that means a complete closure. I thought that was odd. Typically, a complete closure. You can still have like a two hundred, but usually. So we did we did on Friday see quite a substantial number of options being closed in the money calls and out of the money puts. The and then just looking again at the put changes. I don't usually but I thought it was interesting because we kind of saw how well-timed a lot of the uh, significant put players are, which doesn't seem to change. We see that the, we were selling, the retail was selling a lot of puts recently, and it looks like we've now transitioned to purchasing puts. So th these are short puts, retail sh or dealer short puts. So that means retail is now purchasing a lot of puts. And but what's curious too is again, this is the same methodology as before. So these spikes are like significant movements, which is curious. Like you would expect a little bit, like if I if you told me retail was increasing their purchasing of puts, I would kind of just expect a gradual increase, which is like what we see. Oh, did I not include it? I'm gonna pause you right there just to clarify something for people. Mm -hmm. When Justin says retail, he doesn't necessarily mean individual retail investors, you yeah, know, sorry. ordinary people. What he means by retail is people who are sensitive to the price, people who are buying and selling, longing and shorting, buying puts and calls because they want to make money. That's in contrast to a market maker who is price insensitive, doesn't care about the price. They make money on the spread. Mm -hmm. And so they will sell indiscriminately. They will buy indiscriminately. So when, right. when Justin says retail, and in this context, when Deep Dive Stocks in general talks about retail, mm -hmm. what, what we're referring to is somebody that wants to make money off of the price movement. Correct. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so basically retail or price sensitive. <laughs> the iPhone 11. I love that your name's like iPhone 11 Pro also. Um, and I just keep calling you iPhone. <laughs> but... Again, again, my catchphrase, again, but these spikes, price goes up, price goes down. These spikes, price goes up. Liquid just started spiking again. Right? So there's out of the money, long puts. So that's curious, right? We see... The, the, in the past four months, three months, this whoever is purchasing these teals have only been wrong off just eyeballing it twice. There's some pretty good odds. And now we see the same spiking starting to occur. It's pretty interesting. And again, coincidence, right? So this is happening on the five-month BOEX mark. This is happening in the setting of a gamma squeeze with what looks like statistically positive predictions. We're against the purchasing support. Our uh, peak on the influence distribution is in the blue. And now we're seeing these out of the money long puts being opened. And in the past, when these have opened, as we saw both in like the 2019, 2020 data and just briefly looking here, it looks that these are pretty well timed. Yeah. So keep in the back of your mind. Then I thought you guys might just be interested in looking at the put profile from 2019 to current. I don't really, I think if anything, it does still show quite the well timingness. Like look at a, except for some time, like whoever sold a whole bunch of puts here didn't do well, but they did well here. But yeah, just for you guys to look at the, cause it looks like there's a, some fun stuff happening with puts on GME. And so the take home point for the current findings is that we have that five month borrow cycle that seems to be cropping up. Uh, we have this, that weird option cycling, which didn't even make it in here, which is, oh no. Yeah, here we go. I'm sorry. Not only are, I only referenced this with the one in five dollar puts, but we see, anyone see a pattern here? 
this might cook some noodles. This, I have no idea what, what this is. So again, I, a lot of times I will manipulate data to highlight changes, highlight deviance from the norm. I'm all about what's different from the norm. So again, this is the standardized relative amount. And what is this weird pattern here? Anyone see it? It's like there's an inverse relationship between one of the goldish colored lines and the teal line. That's what it looks like to me. I'm gonna, yes, yes, yes. That is true. I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna, ready guys? I'm gonna draw something. Let's go, grab your ruler. I don't think I need a ruler. Okay, that's line one. That's not it, I, forgive my, forgive me. Uh, should I, because I don't know how to, this looks like a, the only thing that comes to mind, de point. twisting of points. It's a medical term. Notice yeah, the, it looks like these two are wrapping around each other, right? And then they widen and then they wrap around each other in closed formation. I should do, that's what I should do. You could tell. So we'll do blue. So notice. Do, 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 and then they wrap. And then they expand. Obviously it's not perfect, but we wrap around and then we expand and then we wrap around. Then we expand and then we wrap around. Anyone want to take a guess? Right. Yeah, like so. If you guys are ever interested, just look up torsades de point, torsades de point, or just call it torsades if you're a cardiologist or emergency medicine. And it's a very characteristic EKG finding when you look at people's hearts because it it mirrors this like wrapping, this like wrap, ooh, and then they expand and then they come back and they wrap. And anyone want to steal my punch of what happened? What happened in March of 2020? 2022, I think was. Oops, anyone? I'm gonna this one. I guess I think I am gonna wait a little bit. You said March of 2020. Yeah, 2022. Oh, 2022. Um. GameStop went from $75 to $200 Yep, pre-split. This was right off of the earnings report. Shortly before that, Ryan Cohen was tweeting a lot about short selling. Yeah. Isn't it, so is it, I haven't looked at it, right? So this would be another area of, of investigating. Does this extend, because this only goes to 2022. Does this pattern extend out? Actually, we do have that data. Somewhere, somewhere. Where did I put it? Not sure, but a lot of um, retail investors that are not bullish on GME probably took out put positions and they got wrecked. A lot of them did. Oops, so less, is it the same? It just seems like whenever this expands and the prices, the dash line is Jimmy's price. And this is because to fit all this in there. So we don't know, did the price go up in 2020, February of 2020? Who knows? So another area of, of investigating, but that is like one of those patterns. And it's kind of the, the a side effect of, I just like to manipulate the data in a way that shows me how everything is connected. What happened in, did anything fun happen in June of 2022 on GME with the price? I don't know. You, 
congratulations. We have now progressed to real time investigating. 20, what did I want? 20 June, 2022. Did you say January or June? Um, zero six, six twenty. I mean, it appreciated, but nothing crazy, right? 12%, 13%. I say nothing crazy. I'm like 12%, 13%. So when it expanded, it started in June at $32 and then ended July at like $32 as well. Nothing crazy. All right, well, maybe worth investigating. But I did find it odd that the last time such a wide whatever this is, GME ran up. And to be fair, GME does experience some hefty price positive days during this expansion. And we see that, and I only bring it up because we see that this expansion is occurring again. May 26, 2022, it had a spike. 26. Yeah, that would have been like right in here. Who knows? Another area of investigating. Yeah, the 25th of May, it looked like it went up almost 30%, 29%. Yeah. And then yeah, the next day, like, it went up 11 and a half. Yeah, it looks like this really starts to split, at least in this moment. on the sixth, but it never really rejoins, right? Like we saw even above when they join, they get very messy together and then they split and this kind of faked us out. So again, who knows? I didn't look into it, but something worth maybe keeping an eye on. So many squiggles. All right. So da, 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 da. we have the five month forward cycling option cycling which seems weird should be looked into the gamma squeeze data and blue is blue blue is blue blue is blue <laughs> blue is blue except when except it's for not. thursday yeah and from from i think friday when red turned into blue that you know. it, that is another interesting thing honestly gme this in with respect to the heat maps this week has been very fascinating I mean, that's one word to use, but that's not what I would use. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, who expects like liquidity to enter GME? It's like based, someone opened the floodgates. And uh, whoever that schmuck was that bought those calls really, really uh, did not benefit from that. I know. This is, you know, some... some... In the max pain. I don't know. I don't really uh, prescribe. Like, uh, prescribe? A max... Max, Max pain is statistically insignificant, and I never pay attention to it. And I don't think other people should either, personally, because I think the, the main purpose of Max pain is to fool retail investors into fixing a price in their head. If you go back and mm -hmm. look at Max pain, let's just say since GameStop stock split, it's been like nine weeks. So we've had nine expirations. Max pain has only been successful twice maybe three times if you kind of give it a couple of strikes like you know tolerance that's not a very good success rate now some other people may say that there are ways that you can use it to your advantage to indicate directionality i don't even know about that i look i just i think it's noise i think it's i think it's useless i think looking at the actual data you know that deep dive stocks um, provides is a lot more useful than even knowing what the heck the max pain price is. Yeah, I appreciate that. I feel like the max pain is a attempt at the heat map, right? Like we can see on the heat map when purchasing switches to selling. That's I think truly the whole point of the heat map. And again, the heat map tells shows us that the max pain point isn't just dependent on price. The max pain really is like here we would wouldn't this range be considered the max pain right 
I mean, yeah, roughly, but it's still off by several strikes sometimes. I think the max gain yeah. on Friday was 26. 26 but yeah we closed like, at 28 which was like six strikes away from max pain that's right. a lot of strikes yeah but i think the what i see in my head is like 26 if even if we did assume that was max pain is only max pain as long as your volatility is greater than like 98 right otherwise exactly. your max pain starts increasing because hedging isn't just dependent on um the options or just depending on the spot it's dependent on iv as well so yeah. again it kind of just uh, definitely a conversation for a different time but whenever i see an entity utilizing options data in an objective way but they don't include volatility it either to me means that they don't appreciate the effects of volatility which are which is staggering in and of itself if you're going to display that data as meaningful and then or they get the significance, but they can't extract the significance. And then they're just banking on everyone else not knowing the significance, right? But yeah. definitely a conversation for a different time. But the, so yeah, summary findings, five month broke cycle option, blue is blue. And so even in this kind of very brief investigation, um, there's already kind of a lot of threads to pull and some things that kind of caught into my uh, attention where I'm curious about those calm periods before the first run-up. The, especially like is, are those calm periods like the normal behavior for the stock until this specific party enters, places their bets, and then leaves? Like what is, the, what are those calm periods basically? The, you would kind of expect a normal baseline level of noise on a stock that has a lot of just casual interest. Not, you know, everything is silent until something happens. And then we can also see these something, ha something these dates that something happens are also associated with other dates or other events, right? Uh, it just seems very suspect. The then and part of that would be I would be very interested in looking at the kind of the exchange. I would probably start teasing out more of the specific flow of these options. What exchanges are they going through? Are they always going through the same exchanges? You know, essentially we want to start building that retail market maker options dealers relationship. We want to start triangulating, you know. Because it's like, think of it like how crazy it would be if those calm periods occur and then those spikes occur. And at the same time, those spikes occur, we see that it's this exchange that has the flow of options and shares. Like they also spike over there. That'd be curious, right? Because now you're like, well, there's a relationship here. And then you can start looking for that relationship other, other places and figuring out, do weird things happen with this relationship in mind anywhere else? My my guess would be yes, and then hey, along Justin. With that, huh, sorry, just real quick. Along with that, I would want to start characterizing um, with a little bit more granularity some of those just the puts on GME in general. I feel like it's definitely interesting. So, like, I would really want to tease out price insensitive versus sensitive, because if I was um, to the only thing that I do know on Jamie that I've read up on are the artificial longs, like how to roll out your shorts. And it would be very curious to see if we could actually like very specifically pinpoint that in the data. Like, wow, look at all these in the money calls and out of the money puts uh, being opened. This seems very characteristic of what we know would be a uh, what is the name for them? Reversal. Right? Maybe. Who knows? But that's kind of where my mind goes with all this. Overall, I think Jimmy, very interesting. Even if, um, like, I definitely do not know as much about it as some of you guys. Nonetheless, I think it's interesting just from a pure data standpoint. The current data are reminiscent i'll put it that way and it, i think it'll be interesting to keep a tab on as we move forward so yeah that's the talk that's gme in a nutshell
not really. I think there's a lot more to it. But thank you for coming, guys. Do you guys have any questions? Anything you want to chat about? Um, but that is the presentation. Justin, I did have something I wanted to throw in because you, you keep talking about coincidences and weird things that happen with GME. Um, and Conway can correct me if I'm wrong on this, but we were talking about dates in 2022. Uh, back in March 28th is when now post split, it would be 47. We almost hit $200 and then got slammed down pretty hard. And I think Conway didn't we even get, it got slammed down so hard, didn't it get halted? Yeah, um, sorry, there's there's some something rubbing up against your microphone, but yeah, uh, there, was, there was a day, I think, maybe two days where GameStop did get halted. I don't really recall them too clearly, but that did happen recently. Um, and yeah, I think, I think we had- I think it was March 28th, and then there was another day in June, because I know you were interested in June. Um, yeah, yeah. Somewhere like June 6th, we got slammed down pretty hard and got, um, I think it was halted then too. And, um, and then they got a little better with slamming us down. They'd slam us down where... Um, you know, it didn't quite trigger a halt, but there were two times there when we got hit really, really hard. You could tell they didn't want us to go any further. They, they weren't going to let it go any further. Mm. Yeah, it is curious. And yeah, I think I bet you could take like one of these map, like one of these, any of these graphs, honestly, and make it like an online whiteboard. And you could probably, I guarantee you, like, some just weird shit would start like being pointed out right um it's curious i missed that whole saga i didn't know gme almost ran it did i remember that i don't know uh, we hit like 48 dollars not too long ago huh. yeah yeah i have to read um i have to read banana hen's uh last update when he said go short like a few weeks ago i just sold it all so i think it might be i wonder i'm curious what he says now he suspended uh, his algo. He's he's not happy with his algo. Oh, uh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Well, we'll chat, I guess. Um, does Harvey asks, does the five months bark cycle line up with Gergen's cycle theory or two different theories? I'm not sure. I don't know his cycle theory, to be honest. I don't um, either. I don't follow him at all. I don't have, I mean, the, not in a negative way, but I don't have, I don't know anything about him. Like, that, but that's not me being like catty. I just, I know he exists. I know he has a theory. I want to say uh, we did briefly chat. And I don't think that they uh, were that unaligned. I don't know if necessarily he was on Houston show number six and nine. I don't know who Houston is either. Sorry. Um, I'm pretty added, out of the loop. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure, unfortunately, yeah. I just don't know who's Houston Wade. Yes, same here. Like I, I know who Houston Wade is. I've seen a couple of his older, much older um episodes on YouTube, but I, I don't follow him at all. Uh, again, it's not being catty. It's just there's only so much time that we have in the day. Yeah. I, I I don't have time to to keep up with everything, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Uh, I mean, Harvey, I guess you would be the one like do the dates line up. If the dates line up, then I would say there's probably no um they were probably looking at maybe the same phenomenon from just two different angles, especially the dates line up. Is there a way to estimate directionalized? If it looks similar, then I could, I wouldn't be surprised if we're, yeah, just looking at the same probably just, um, combination of events, just probably from different angles. Is, and then is there a way to estimate directionalized uh, open interest in combination with the change in the strike graph? Uh, yeah, no, there is. I just don't do it. <laughs> the, the so essentially i'm assuming you're asking like uh could like instead of not only with the close but like you know percent long percent short closure like i'm assuming that's what yeah uh yeah no you totally could um i just don't do it namely because the i'm all about like removing redundancy and the options direction graph or the options direction count table has that information. Like it'll tell you 
So we could just literally, we, uh, we could just go to that table, but it's not on, the, on this presentation and say like, all right, the end of money puts, right? What was the change? And if the, so I guess it wouldn't give you the, this percentage of options that closed, it would just give you the total sum of those in the, in the money puts that were long or short that opened or closed. Um, just cause I don't know how, yeah, I'll put that on the back burner. I'll put that on the maybe list. I'll investigate like the, I'll make a few of them, see if it's, if I feel like it's helpful or aesthetically easy to read, but it's actually not a terrible idea. Cool. Yeah. Anything else, guys? Um, I, I guess real quick, how would one protect oneself if you were to buy options? How would you protect yourself from being IV crushed, theoretically speaking? But mm. also, like, why did this hypothetical person that got crushed on their naked call options? <laughs> uh, like, wh what was this person seeing? This is not a criticism. This is just, you know, honest honest question why would that person have felt confident enough to go naked instead of trading a spread for example the this person may have misread the date of the earnings that may be first and foremost and then the which maybe he read on when the day before earnings in his mind or their mind and he and they opened these calls they did they were slightly surprised when at market closed he saw a tweet from maybe conway saying join me tomorrow for gme's option or for gme's um earnings that may have caught them by surprise uh so there's that and then there's because at the time the price was like 26 or so e maybe i can't remember exactly it was higher than it was the day before actual earnings and so the strike out of the moneyness wasn't that significant and the epr table had 30 well within reach i do explicitly remember you stating this was me we'll drop them sorry guys drop the pretense i do remember you explicitly stating that earnings typically saw a decrease in volatility hence why i went only slightly out of the money and or what i thought felt was reasonable but truly did not expect such a significant so two things hit me on that play pure pure um the data was sound the execution was not uh, and for reference the data was the e3 algorithm i had hope of golden cross price increase yeah right i think so the e3 algorithm said go long so i went long um but I miss, I did the date of the earnings wrong. I had it in my head wrong. So that implicitly skewed which strike I chose. Uh, and then I underestimated the, the volatility crush significantly. In hindsight, probably even if I wanted to go long still, probably should have checked previous GME earnings since it seems to be a theme that volatility uh, drops like a lead weight. Or you could purchase deep in the money so vega isn't really gonna you're gonna be less affected by vega and you essentially are just going long on the option or long on the stock or you can do a spread so i think in hindsight and maybe on all earnings plays especially as the e3 always read on earnings yeah well I mean, not like, this earnings this earnings wasn't red yeah this earning was green green um but still because the volatility crush my calls didn't even have a chance to recover truthfully yeah um, so it's two things one acknowledge like a better wherewithal of my surroundings to position myself better and then as a blanket term a uh, call spread would have protected me against IV crush significantly had i done a call spread uh it would have been like an like a 100 pr profitable venture so as an example you would buy like an at the money call you would sell another call at a higher strike maybe a couple of strikes away and give yourself some time like maybe a couple mm -hmm. weeks right yeah as an example all right and the cool thing with spreads is you know if you buy a 20 dollar call so you go long here and say you just for uh, intents and purposes you go you short a 40 dollar right 
and say your expiry is one month. In as long as you're above 20, one month later, it's a profit, it's a hundred percent profitable position. You're because you're do 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 you're like PL graph. Maybe I mean you might have to be slightly above, right? But we'll look like this. We're like this is zero. It's like an upside down backwards PL. But that's the beauty of spreads is as long as like you're literally above the strike of your long position, you will typically experience profitability. And so that's why I know had I done that, had I done a spread, uh, it would just would have been a profitable position. The only thing, again, like the unprofitability was both my fault because I don't know how dates work. And then that IV, I mean, that IV movement was insane. I don't think I've ever seen an IV movement like that. We actually dropped all the way back to what our lowest point was back in May. If you look at the IV now, oh, really? GameStop IV is actually tremendously low. So in, in two days, we dropped, like we, we, we kind of bottomed, a, a, you know, a few weeks ago, and then we started slowly trending up. And then in the two days that just passed, Friday and Thursday, we just plummeted all the way back. And now our current implied volatility, at least according to Thinkorswim, is back what it was Oh, wait, no, I'm getting my dates mixed up. But we, we are like they were? at the most recent bottom again. Right. And, and, and we kind of like implied volatility also affects the price of options. So if implied volatility is going up, you're, you're, the, the worth of your option could go up as well, right? And I, I just find it so interesting. And maybe interesting isn't the correct word to be using. I just find it so interesting that the price moved the way it did in relation to the heat map, in relation to what IV did and everything like that. Because what I was looking at was, um, I was looking at the $25 strike, the call options that expired this past week. And they bottomed at around 59 cents or $59 a contract uh, Thursday afternoon. And by the end of Friday, the very next day, they were worth $4.00. Up and five cents or four hundred and five dollars per contract. Yeah, enormous it, move in a declining IV environment. You don't have to like rub it in. If I, I'm not, I'm not trying to rub it in, Justin. If I, I'm trying to tell people got like, the date right. Imagine if I got the date right. Because right? <laughs> yeah. uh, let's everything the everything the same. I realized that earnings because I feel like just for also everyone else. Um, one of the active researches of deep dive stocks is something called the E3 algorithm or the earning and earning with earnings. And part of, as I'm researching it, I'm dipping my toes and playing with the data to see how does it feel. Um, also, I never like tell people the data is sound unless I've also either like gained or lost um, because of that data. And so the E3 algorithm said go long. And I typically want to enter a position from earnings the day before. That's the anticipated like um, strategy for these earnings. And so, yeah, just had I like looked at the calendar or like actually verified the date of the earnings, what a difference that would have made. Because even if I then still bought $30 calls, which I probably would have lowered the strike or even if keeping everything the same, if I'd bought those $30 calls, even with the IV crush, like because of how the price dropped prior to earnings, I feel like it, it was still would have been such a, a, a profitable position, but for sure. Yeah. yeah. You know, it, dates, this, how do they this work? Is, this is why, you know, you know, Justin and, and myself, uh, we stress learning about the Greeks. If you're going to be playing options, know how they can mess with you. And all that other sort of thing. And and Justin has had like thank you, Justin, for having these, you know, on a regular basis. You've yeah, taught no you've taught us so much. Um, I definitely recommend other people who um haven't seen those videos to go check them out. And um yeah, th there's there's just so much to 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 know about options and like options run the market, you know. Options uh you know, it's we can clearly level. see that um yeah. We, we can clearly see that options uh, are very, very significant with GameStop as well. And this is not like, again, this is not recommending that people trade options right off the bat. Like definitely learn about them though, you know, yeah. understand them to, to understand how they affect the market, how they affect your investments. Yeah. As yeah. Well. Harvey, they're on YouTube. They're on YouTube. Um, this one will be up on YouTube then too, uh, usually within the next few days. I, yeah, but the previous ones are up on YouTube. I think maybe, 
except for one. There was a member who's only one where we did OPEX. Um, I think that's the only one that's not up. Um, which OPEX, everyone remember, is coming up this week. So that should be interesting. Um, but yeah, yeah. I, it's, it's also, I think, healthy to share, you know, I've been playing with options for years. Obviously, um, I enjoy them. I think they're interesting. I'm, I think I know a thing or two about them, but like, I can still, like, even I still mess up the fundamentals <laughs> sometimes, right? Like, sometimes I buy a call when I meant to buy a put. And like, that doesn't make me any, like, it makes me aloof, but I think it's, everyone should know that, you know, I think there's like, there's, this is a whole nother discussion too, but like, there's always this like image that people try to keep. I'm not interested in keeping that image, right? Like, I'm really good with data. Sometimes I don't know calendars exist. I don't have to tell you, <laughs> you know? So it's not like a shameful thing and it's not like, um, I don't feel like it, it like messes with any of the validity of the data and the research. It just is human nature, right? So just in the, keep in the back of your mind, like if there's people on other people who just seem to always do things correctly, it's not real, right? It's not real. Yeah, that's a red flag for sure. You know what's funny, Harvey, you said make a checklist. When I was a kid, uh, one of the many things I had to do because I'm very forgetful was I had to check, my parents made me make checklists for everything. Like before I go to school, there was a checklist. Do I have everything? Before I came home from school, a checklist. Do I have everything? Um, it's called executive functioning disorder and part of my brain just doesn't exist. So yeah, like I'll leave the house to go to work or when I used to work for the fire department without shoes on, <laughs> shoe stories. Um, so sometimes things like dates get away from me, but whole nother conversation for another time. It would help us. Oh, you mean I make you a checklist? Yeah, I could do that. Yeah, sure. I thought you meant like I should make a checklist. I was like, that was very apt of you to recommend because that's actually been the recommendation everyone has ever given me always. So very, very quick on the pickup there. Uh, yeah, I could, I could brainstorm. I actually wanted to make something like that, like an algorithm. I also started a while ago doing a flow chart of like, okay, say I'm in this call position See about oh yeah this that's kind of everything guys so feel free to you're not going to miss anything if you need to pop out or want to pop out um i'm just kind of rambling at this point but but thank you everyone for coming i appreciate it and see you guys next week um yeah but yeah so i wanted to make i thought it would be cool to have like a you know all right i'm in a long position i have a call I bought a call and oh crap, the price is moving against me. How can I salvage this position? Um, and it would just kind of be like a series of questions to ask yourself, like, do I still expect the price to go up? Is volatility, what is wrong? Like, why is your, value, your position losing value? See everyone, thanks again for coming. Um, and it would kind of just give you like a brief, like, hey, you know, if it's because IV is dropping, why don't you go ahead and sell a deep out of the money, long dated option, right? And then that way you can kind of, neutralize your vega without sacrificing too much of your delta and maybe still be able to salvage some profitability um so i was thinking about doing one of those things lots on the to-do list but yeah any other questions guys thank you seriously for coming and the input you guys have provided like immense input and helped to connect actually a lot of dots you want to do a disclaimer for uh, liability purposes? I have a, a boilerplate one I can read off for you if you want. <laughs> uh, I will. It's not a terrible idea. Do, 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 do. This content is for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. The information contained herein should not be construed as investment or other advice, nor is it a recommendation or solicitation to purchase or sell any specific security at any time. While it is believed the information presented is reliable at the time of recording, no representation or warranty is made concerning the accuracy of any data provided. The content is also subject to change without notice. The content creator involved assume no responsibility to update this information. Um, I guess that includes me, since I'm chiming in here. Uh, Justin, are you registered as a security broker dealer or no, investment advisor? I am not registered as anything. Okay. Yeah, me neither. Not in any jurisdiction. Also, they are not intended to be a complete description of the securities market, uh, securities markets or developments referred to in the material.
We cannot and do not assess, verify, or guarantee the adequacy, accuracy, or completeness of any information, the suitability or profitability of any particular investment, or the potential value of any investment or informational source. Additionally, we in no way warrant the solvency, financial condition, investment advisability, or any of the securities mentioned in our presentation. Furthermore, we accept no liability whatsoever for a direct, indirect, or consequential loss arising from any use of deep dive stocks or anything that Justin or I uh, present or other contents. Do your own research. There's always the possibility to lose all your money. Um, do not base any investment decision upon any materials found on here, on the website, on Instagram, Discord, social media in general. Um, and past results do not predict future results. Uh, I think that's Very cool. pretty Thank comprehensive, you. so. Yeah. yeah, at the end of the day, this could all be fake, who knows? Yeah. I mean, the data can just apparently change because Nasdaq uh, has a problem. It does have a tendency to like just pivot really quickly. Um, yeah. But all right, guys, I'm going to, I think I'll, I'll cut it here. Um, I have to spruce up the weekly chat that's going to get sent out here soon. And then, yeah, it's a pretty, you know, I'm always had mixed feelings on like the manipulator word, right? Like you can it could be right or this could just be how things work and either is fine because as long as you can like view how things work you can make money in it and so yeah th things also just change on a dime like intraday as well yeah and if you're not keeping track of that then you know you could you could yeah you, you could be uh you, you could be exposing yourself to risk that you don't realize like an example would be bed bath and beyond recently when it shot up all the way to thirty dollars and then just crashed you know right after to like i don't know eight dollars or lower right you know um part of the reason the, the in my opinion the real reason that that happened was we just saw a tremendous amount of bearish flows into the options market you know you can talk about the filings and this and that or whatever but look a lot of puts came in and that was a signal to the market and then that kind of rug pulled everybody that was long on the position yeah um and if you didn't see that, then then you got rug pulled. I did see that, and I still didn't make the decision to get out. So I, overall, I was still profitable in it, but not nearly as much as I would have been had mm -hmm. I just listened to myself instead of. Yeah, it happens. You know, There's yeah. always that connect between like, like like that's. There's, I always trading is two actual activities wrapped into one, right? Like it's harvesting, processing, and validating data, and then acting on that data. And yep. It's perfect when those two align and then, but sometimes, you know, there's always a little bit of a disconnect there. And the goal of being a successful trader is just to minimize the disconnect and the amount of times that disconnect happens. So um, totally natural stuff, but yeah, we'll see. I, I think a pretty somewhat exciting week ahead of us potentially. So um, I agree. Cool. Thank you everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, yeah, if you have no more, unless there's any other questions, I'm going to bow out and I will talk to everyone later and look forward oh. to having you guys next week. Why don't we, why don't we talk a, real quick about deep dive stocks? Um, look, I, I'm not paid by Justin. I don't get any kickbacks or, any, or anything like that. I'm just a subscriber and uh, I like it. I like it a lot. And it's made me a lot more money than it cost me. If you want to sign up, obviously joining just the general discord is, is free, but you don't really get much in there. Yeah. You can sign up for um, a single stock service and you pay $25 a month and the full subscription is $150 a month. Um, so you have options there um, if you're interested in the data that comes out daily. And there's a lot of data that, that comes out of deep dive stocks every single day. So um, personally, I do highly recommend it. And again, I'm not, you know, I'm not uh, affiliated financially with uh, deep dive stocks at all. This is just uh, a, a customer testimonial. Um, I like it a lot. I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. No um, problem. I'm a terrible salesperson. I feel like it's so cheesy. To, like be like, oh, get me. You know, I, I know. I know. And I've been there before, which is why I'm doing it for you. Right. Like yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I don't get any money from, from endorsing deep dive stocks at all. I just, mm -hmm. I believe in the product and I know a lot of people out there um, you know, they may be very interested in the market and playing options even in, in the market, um, but kind of in the dark a little bit. Yeah. So, and that's there's... honestly, that's my target audience. You know, um, the, there's a lot to juggle with deep dive, but really, um, 
getting the educational out there, educational content out there. Cause I feel like when I was learning options, it was very, you know, you would either read something that was like a call is a obligation to purchase shares or like a pro, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then like, if you needed something above that, it was like an options dealer will be long or short put if they're vague, you know what I mean? Like there was such a wide gap um yeah. that really had to be bridged on my own and i kind of want to be the entity that fills that like i want to be the, the for the people who are truly interested um but they just need that like more of a structured how do i learn about all this stuff and still make it practical so that's kind of what i try to do um yeah. a lot of it is based i think in these types of live chats and discussions and youtube videos um so that, you know, also you get a sense of everyone who knows everything about all this stuff is still went through the process of learning about this stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Harvey. Um, the heat maps, uh, I think the heat maps are great. They were one of the big goals of D I was deep dives was a thing for about a year before the heat maps came out. And that was actually, it took a lot of infrastructure upgrading and code optimization. A lot of data gets poured into those heat maps. Uh, and so before they could, I think the first heat map I made on Spy maybe two years ago took 15 minutes to produce. And now they take about maybe 10 seconds or so. <laughs> so yeah, thanks for interest. Thanks for coming. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah. As far as it being a play, look, anything and everything can always be a play. The, the interesting thing and the nice thing about the market and in some ways options particularly is that like you can make money if things are going up you can make money if things are going down you can even make money if things are going sideways and they don't do anything um there's a lot of possibilities out there so you know all that this presentation was about from what i gathered was looking at what past behavior was and what it's doing right now and we'll have to see if it follows the same pattern yeah you know Kind of like what we were just saying in the disclaimer is that like past results don't necessarily predict future results, but with, you know, with certain things, there are some pretty noticeable patterns and, and we see them playing out right now. So yeah. we'll, we'll see. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I hope the trend continues too, especially I think full disclaimer, I think, well, I'm, I'm not even going to say it. So, all right. Now, thank you. Thank you, Conway, for that. Um, that is... I have a, what, one of my advisors is always like, you never advertise deep dive stocks. And I'm like, I don't never, <laughs> it feels weird to me. So thank you for doing good, that. Look, good information mm -hmm. sells coming. itself. Huh? I'm good sorry. information sells itself. Right. Yeah. That's kind of what I think, right? Like if you guys, yeah. if people enjoy this data, if it's actionable, if they find value in it, then they'll come, they'll come get it. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Seriously. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. It's actually been the biggest turnout a live chat has had. And so that's exciting. And thank you, Conway, for the help, the participation, the insights, and everyone else as well. Yeah, I think I'm pretty, I think I'm gonna, yeah, I gotta go write the weekly email, guys. <laughs> so I'm gonna cut, I'm gonna cut out here. And um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Have a good day. And I'll see you guys next time. Bye. Thank you for everything, Justin. Take care. Bye.